Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all you travelers across the vast expanses of the internet. My name is Mitek Schwong. I'm an unsuccessful Mulderidge man, and this is my stream, Dorkly Lit, where we apparently we read a role playing game rule books. Today, I'm going to read for you the first bit of Dungeon Master's Guide to Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition, and hopefully comment on, on some of the, the stuff therein. The purpose of this of this read along is it's it's not to provide an audiobook or an alternative to the book or to um abuse the uh, the copyright of of its rightful copyright owners but rather to give you guys an interest in role playing games those of you who haven't tried it and maybe get some insight into DMing to those of you who are maybe have tried Dungeons and Dragons or tried any other tabletop RPG but want to find out more about being a DM in it because they've only been a player, for example. And I am not familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, I have to I have to tell you right off the bat, but I am familiar with other tabletop RPG systems. And if you're not specifically into Dungeons and Dragons or you're not specifically into fantasy, you might still want to give this read along a shot. And even if you don't want this want to give this read along a shot, please give uh, tabletop role-playing games a shot because they are very worthy past time. Without further ado, let's get to the introduction. Introduction. It's good to be the dungeon master. Not only do you get to tell fantastic stories about heroes, villains, monsters and magic, but you also get to create the world in which these stories live. Whether you're running a D&D game already or you think it's something you want to try, this book is for you. The Dungeon Master's Guide assumes you do know the basics of how to play the, dungeon, the Dungeons & Dragons tabletop role-playing game. If you haven't started before, the Dungeons & Dragons starter set is a great starting point for new players and DMs. This book has two important, compa com important companions. The Player's Handbook, which contains the rules your players need to create characters and the rules you need to run the game, and the Monster Manual, which contains ready-to-use monsters to populate your D&D world. By the way, I heartily recommend that you buy the Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide if you're interested in, in being the Dungeon Master. Because uh, I'd like to emphasize that this read-along, it's not an audiobook. And even if there was an official audiobook for, uh, for the Dungeon Master's Guide, you're gonna need the tables in here. You're gonna need a lot of things that work as... Um, as help materials, things that suggest tavern names that you can roll on, and you can't really rely on a on a purely auditory source to to bail you out when you when you need to look something up. So for that, you're gonna need to invest in your own book. And yeah, with that out of the way, let's let's get back to the reading. The dungeon master, the dungeon master DM, is to create a force behind a D and D game. The DM creates a world. For other players to explore and also creates the ru and runs adventures that drive the story. An adventure typically hinges on the successful completion of a quest and can be as short as a single game session. Longer adventures might embroil players in great conflicts that require multiple game sessions to resolve. When strung together, these adventures form an ongoing campaign. A D&D campaign can include dozens of adventures that last for months or years. A dungeon master gets to wear many hats. As the architect of a campaign, the DM creates adventures by placing monsters, traps and treasures for the other player's characters, the adventurers, to discover. As a storyteller, the DM helps the other players visualize what's happening around them, improvising when the adventurers do something or go somewhere unexpected. As an actor, the DM plays the roles of the monsters and sporting characters, breathing life into them. And as a referee, the DM interprets the rules and decides when to abide by them and when to change them. Inve inventing, writing, storytelling, improvising, acting, refereeing. Every DM handles these roles diff differently and you'll probably enjoy some more than others. It helps to remember that Dungeons & Dragons is a hobby and being the DM should be fun. Focus on the aspects you enjoy and downplay the rest. For example, if you don't like creating your own adventures, you can use published ones. You can also lean on the other players to help you with the rules mastery and world building. The D&D rules help you and the other players have a good time, but the rules aren't in charge. You're the DM and you are in charge of the game. 
That said, you, your goal isn't to slaughter the adventurers, but to create a campaign world that revolves around their actions and decisions, and to keep your players coming back for more. If you're lucky, the events of your campaign will echo in the memories of your players long after the final session is concluded. So we have to em emphasize that the, that the Dungeon Master isn't against the players. He, he's not trying to kill them. That's, a, that's an interesting point. And uh, he has to, in my opinion, as a DM, it's best to think to yourself what could cause the most trouble, what could cause the most mischief, what could make what's going to happen the most interesting, shocking, cinematic happening that could happen. And try to do that. Obviously, you can't really railroad your players to, to to do certain things to facilitate what you want even if it's going to be by the cinematic like you want it to you can't really you have to leave them the choice and you need a you need a fine balance for that also they mentioned that uh that an adventure is typically uh, the scope of a single quest that needs to be completed the other other i don't really agree with that part i think that it's supposed to be a story like you, you should aim. I, I like to use the word cinematic a lot when describing how I like my tabletop RPGs. I think you should aim for a story as good as a movie. It never comes out that way because uh, the players like to spend time shopping. They do stuff that's anticlimactic. That's that's unnecessary. It's pointless. That's ridiculous at times. But it has a certain charm to it. Uh, but you have to you have to like pull in the direction of the epic if you want a chance for the epic to happen in your game and once or twice it's gonna happen I promise to you it's worth it it's gonna happen once or twice so how to use this book this book is organized in three parts the first part helps you decide what kind of campaign you'd like to run the second part helps you create the adventures the stories that will compose the campaign and keep the players entertained from one game session to the next the last part helps you adjudicate the rules of the game and modify them to suit the style of your campaign part one Every DM is the creator of his or her own campaign world. Whether you invent a world, adapt a world from a favorite movie or novel, or use a published setting for the D&D game, you make the world your own over the course of the campaign. The world where you set your campaign is one of countless worlds that make up the D&D multiverse, a vast array of planes and worlds where adventures happen. Even if you're using an established world such as the Forgotten Realms, your campaign takes place in a sort of mirror universe of the official setting where Forgotten Realms novels, game products and digital games are assumed to take place. The world is yours to change as you see fit and yours to modify as you explore the consequences of the player's actions. And by the way, if you're new to Dungeons and Dragons, um, magic, uh, any fantasy world and you're not familiar what they mean when they say play, it's basically in the multiverse of, uh, of Dungeons and Dragons a plane is a is an alternate dimension, an alternate world that's uh, that you can with powerful spells you can move from one to another. And there is a map, there is a part of the book later on that explains what planes are uh, strict more strictly and uh, what canon planes exist. Your world is more than just a backdrop for adventures like Middle-earth, Westeros and countless other fantasy worlds out there. It's a place to which you can escape and witness fantastic stories untold. unfold. Sorry, A well-designed and well-run world seems to flow around the adventurers so that they feel a part of something instead of apart from it. Consistency is a key to a believable fictional world. When the adventurers go back into town for supplies, they should encounter the same non-player characters, NPCs, they met before. Soon they'll learn the barkeep's name, and he or she will remember theirs as well. Once you've achieved this degree of consistency, you can provide any occasional change. If the adventurers come back to buy more horses at the, at the stables, they might discover that the man who ran the place went back home to the large city over the hills, and now his niece runs the family business. That sort of change, one that has nothing to do with the adventurers directly, but one they'll, that they'll notice, makes the players feel as though the characters are a part of a living world that changes and grows along with them. Part 1 of this book is all about inventing your world. Chapter 1 asks what type of game you want to run and helps you nail down a few important details about your world and its overarching conflicts. Chapter 2 helps you put your world in a greater context of the multiverse, expanding on the information presented in the player's handbook to discuss the planes of existence and the gods and how you can put them together 
to serve the needs of your campaign. It's pretty cool art. Part 2. Master of Adventures. Whether you write your own adventures or use, or use published ones, expect to invest preparation time beyond the hours you spend at the gaming table. You'll need to carve out some free time to exercise your creativity as you invent compelling plots, create new NPCs, craft encounters, and think of clever ways to foreshadow story events yet to come. Part 2 of this book is devoted to helping you create and run great adventures. Chapter 3 covers the basic elements of a D&D adventure, and Chapter 4 helps you create memorable NPCs. Chapter 5 presents guidelines and advice for running adventures set in dungeons, the wilderness and other locales. And Chapter 6 covers the time between adventures. Chapter 7 is all about treasure, magic items and special rewards that help keep the players invested in your campaign. Ideally, uh, the story should keep your players invested in your campaign and the uh, they shouldn't be there to get loot or get levels. This isn't a video game, by the way. If you if you came from the world of, of video games, I strongly urge you not to treat your tabletop RPG the same way as a as an inf or I strongly urge you not to treat your tabletop RPG as if it were a more primitive version of a video game where you have to use dice to to adjudicate everything, but as something more than video games, as something where you you fully utilize the creativity given to you, and the world is realistic, is believable. Nothing happens like a like a scripted event, like a reward in a video game where you kill a boss and you lose its chest and you get the rewards, or where everything is uh, hand tailored to to have progression and challenged. No, treat it as a world, treat it as a story of your characters and of you as a DM that you want to tell. Don't care if something is out of place for how difficult it is or how easy it is or how unrewarding it is or how rewarding it is. No, try not to think about it. I feel that other systems in Dungeons & Dragons have a lot to offer when it comes to perspective on your, on your gaming experience by not focusing on the rules, by focusing on the narrative, by focusing on the story. And that's the way I like to think about my tabletop RPGs. Part 3, Master of the Rules. Dungeons & Dragons isn't a head-to-head -head competition, but it needs someone who is impartial yet involved in the game to guarantee that everyone at the table plays by the rules. As the player who creates the game world and the adventures that take place within it, the DM is a natural fit to take on the referee role. As a referee, the DM acts as a mediator between the, the rules and the players. A player tells the DM what he or she wants to do, and the DM determines whether it is successful or not. In some cases, asking the player to make a die roll to determine success. For example, if a player wants his or her character to take a swing at an orc, you say, make an attack roll, while looking up the orc's armor class. The rules don't account for every possible situation that might arise during a typical D&D session. For example, a player might want his or her character to hurl a brazier full of hot coals into a monster's face. How you determine the outcome of this action is up to you. You might tell the player to make a strength check while mentally setting the difficulty class at 15. If the strength check is successful, you then determine how a face full of hot coals affects the monster. You might decide that it deals 1d4 fire damage and imposes disadvantage on the monster's attack rolls until the end of its next turn. You roll the damage die or let the player do it and the game continues. Sometimes mediating the rules means setting limits. If a player, if a player tells you, I want to run up and attack the orc, but the character doesn't have enough movement to reach the orc, you say, it's too far away to move up and still attack, what would you like to do instead? The player takes the information and comes up with a different plan. To referee the rules, you need to know them. You don't have to memorize this book or the player's handbook, but you should have a clear idea of the contents, so that when a situation requires a ruling, you know where to find the proper resource. The player's handbook contains the main rules you need to play the game. Part 3 of this book offers a wealth of information to help you adjudicate the rules in a wide variety of situations. Chapter 8 presents advice for using attack rolls, ability checks and saving throws. It also includes options appropriate for certain play styles and, campaign and campaigns, including guidelines for using miniatures, a including guidelines for using miniatures, a system for handling chase scenes, and rules for madness. If you like to create your own stuff, such as new monsters, races, and character backgrounds, chapter 9 shows you how. That chapter also contains optional rules for, for unusual situations, 
or play styles such as the use of firearms in a fantasy setting. Know your players. The success of a D&D game hinges on your ability to entertain the other players at the game table, whereas their role is to create characters, the protagonists of the campaign, breathe life into them, and help steer the campaign through their characters' actions. Your role is to keep the players and yourself interested and immersed in the world you've created, and to let the characters do awesome things. Knowing what your players enjoy most about the D&D game helps you create and run adventures that they will enjoy and remember. Once you know which, the which of the following activities each player in your group enjoys the most, you can tailor adventures to satisfy your players' preferences as much as possible, thus keeping them engaged. Acting Players who enjoy acting like getting into character and speaking in their characters' voices are all players at heart. They enjoy, they enjoy social interactions with NPCs, monsters and their fellow party members. Engage players who like acting by giving them opportunities to develop their characters' personalities and backgrounds, allowing them to interact regularly with NPCs, adding role-playing elements to combat encounters, incorporating elements from the characters' backgrounds into your adventures. I feel like you have to incorporate elements from your characters' backgrounds, or else, like, oh, what's the point? What's the point of having uh, characters in a story where none of who the character is is a part of the story? I get that some of some people just treat it as a, like a necessary evil, and they just want to be a a paladin in the game and hack orcs to bits and roll dice and see how well they optimize their character. But that's really not my style of of playing, and probably a lot of my takes are not going to be to your liking if you're the sort of player who, who just wants to optimize them. And fight, but if you're a if you're a role player at heart, or if you're an if you're a role player, maybe in addition to being an optimizer, uh, which I don't think really these two agree very well, but you do you, I suppose. Uh, feel free to stay and listen, and uh, well, even if you hate what I have to say about about the game, you can st stay and listen, but it's not going to be very good for your psyche. Just saying. Exploring. Players who desire exploration and want to experience the wonders that the fantasy world has to offer. They want to know what's around the next corner or hill. They also like to find hidden clues and treasure. Engage players who like exploration by dropping clues that hint at things yet to come, letting them find things that they take the time to explore, providing rich des descriptions of exciting environments and using interesting maps or props, giving monsters secrets to uncover or cultural details to learn. Instigating. Players who like to instigate action are eager to make things happen, even if that means taking perilous risks. They would rather rush headlong in, into danger and face the consequences than face boredom. Engage players who like to instigate by allowing them to affect their surroundings, including things in your adventures to tempt them, letting their actions put the characters in a tight spot, including encounters with NPCs who are feisty and unpredictable as they are. I think this is my favorite type of player. It's so nice to have a player who's very proactive at your table and others are just talking about where they should go or saying how they need to buy an extra length of rope and yada yada yada. There's this one player who just wants to go in and he goes in. That's, uh, that's very nice because it, a lot of the time it just forces the other players to follow because they don't want to split the party. And you like action to happen fast. I give you my word that uh, some of your games are gonna stretch out because uh, the players can't decide, the players want to do their shopping. Uh, it just comes about this way. Every now and then a game grinds to a halt, though despite everybody's best intentions and you really want a, you really want a player who just likes adventuring and doesn't care about winning and doesn't care about getting that extra length of rope in your party. And if you're just a player, if you're not a DM, try to be that player. Fighting. Players who enjoy fantasy combat like kicking the tar out of villains and monsters, they look for any excuse to start a fight, favoring bold action over careful deliberation. Engage players who like fighting by springing unexpected combat encounters on them, vividly describing the havoc the characters wreck with their attacks and spells, including combat encounters with large numbers of weak monsters, interrupting social interaction and exploration with combat. Optimizing. Players who enjoy optimizing their characters' capabilities, 
like to fine tune their characters for peak combat performance by gaining levels, new features and magic items. They welcome any opportunity to demonstrate their character's superiority. Engage players who like optimization by ensuring steady access to new abilities and spells, using desired magic items as adventure hooks, including encounters that let their characters shine, providing quantifiable rewards like experience points for non-combat encounters. I don't really much like players like that, to be honest, because when they have to choose between something that, uh, that's, a good, that's a good decision strategically and something that would make sense in character for them, they're gonna make the strategic decision. And when they write the character story, they're gonna bend the story out of shape just to facilitate them taking a strong feat or being the right race, the, the optimum race. And it's... It does twist the the adventure or the character in, in subtle ways, and I'm not really all for it. I don't like optimizing. Sorry. I mean, everybody, most of us gamers, do have a, a little streak that tells us, "Oh, you should you should optimize. You should take that polar mastery with uh, with a great weapons master to to get the." extra plus 10 on your bonus action and you're gonna do great damage per, per round uh, but ultimately I'm not here for, for rolling higher numbers on, on my dice uh, I, I am a, a bit of a power gamer when it comes to PC games but I don't, I don't like that in, in tabletop RPG I'm, I'm in tabletop RPG for my stories Problem solving. Players who want to solve problems like to scrutinize NPC motivations, untangle a villain's machinations, solve puzzles and come up with plans. Engage players who like to solve problems by including encounters that, emph that emphasize problem solving, rewarding planning and tactics with in-game benefits, occasionally allowing a smart plan to grant an easy win for the players, creating NPCs with complex motives. Storytelling. Players who love storytelling want to contribute to a narrative. They like it when their characters are heavily invested in an unfolding story. They enjoy encounters that are tied to and expand an overarching plot. Engage players who like their story storytelling by using the characters' backgrounds to help shape the stories of the campaign. Make sure an encounter advances the story in some way. Making their characters' actions help steer future events, giving NPCs ideals, bonds and flaws that the adventurers can exploit. That's a cool art. Master of Worlds. Chapter 1. A world of your own. Your world is the setting for your campaign, the place where adventures happen. Even if you use an existing setting, such as the Forgotten Realms, it becomes yours. As you set your adventures there, create characters to inhabit it, and make changes to it over the course of your campaign. This chapter is all about building your world, and then creating a campaign to take place in it. The Big Picture. This book, the Player's Handbook, and the Monster Manual, present the default assumptions of how the worlds of D&D work. Among the established settings of D&D, the Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, Dragonlance and Mystara don't stray very far from these assumptions. Settings such as Dark Sun, Eberron, Ravenloft, Spelljammer and Planescape venture further away from that baseline. As you create your own world, it's up to you to decide where on the spectrum you want your world to fall. Core Assumptions The rules of the game are based on the following core assumptions about the game world. Gods oversee the world. The gods are real and embody a variety of beliefs, with each god claiming dominion over an aspect of the world such as war, forests or the sea. Gods exert influence over the world by granting divine magic to the followers and sending signs and portents to guide them. The follower of a god serves as an agent of that god in the world. The agent seeks to further the ideals of that god and defeat its rivals. While some folk might refuse to honor the gods, none can deny their existence. Much of the world is untamed. Wild regions abound, city-states, confederacies and kingdoms of various sizes dot the landscape, but beyond their borders, the wilds crowd in. People know the area they live in well. They've heard stories of other places from merchants and travelers, but few know what lies beyond the mountains or in the depths of the great forest, unless they've been there themselves. The world is ancient. Empires rise and fall, leaving few places that have not been touched by imperial grandeur or decay. War, time and natural forces eventually claim the mortal world, leaving it rich with places of adventure and mystery. Ancient civilizations and their knowledge survive in legends, 
magic items and their ruins. Chaos and evil often follow an empire's collapse. Conflict shapes the world's history. Powerful individuals strive to make their mark on the world, and factions of like-minded individuals can alter the course of history. Factions include relig religions led by charismatic prophets, kingdoms ruled by lasting dynasties, and shadowy societies that seek to master long-lost magic. The influence of such factions waxes and wanes as they compete with each other for power. Some seek to preserve the world and usher in the Golden Age. Others strive towards evil ends, seeking to rule the world with an iron fist. Still others seek goals that range from practical to the esoteric, such as the accumulation of material wealth or the resurrection of a dead god. Whatever their goals, these factions inevitably collide, creating conflict that can steer the world's fate. The world is magical. Practitioners of magic are relatively few in number, but they leave evidence of their craft everywhere. The magic can be as innocuous and commonplace as a potion that heals wounds to something more rare and impressive, such as a levitating tower or a stone golem guarding the gates of the city. Beyond the realms of civilization are caches of magic items, guarded by magic traps as well as magically constructed dungeons inhabited by monsters created by magic as by magic or endowed with magical abilities. A lot of magic in that part. It's your world. In creating your campaign world, it helps to start with the core assumptions and consider how your setting might change them. The subsequent sections of this chapter address each element and give details on how to flesh out your world with gods, factions and so forth. The assumptions sketched out above aren't carved in stone. They inspire exciting D&D &D worlds full of adventure, but they're not the only set of assumptions that can do so. You can build an interesting campaign concept by altering one or more of, the, of those core assumptions just as well established D&D worlds have done. Ask yourself, what is the standard assumption? What if the standard assumptions weren't true in my world? The world is a mundane place. What if magic is rare and dangerous and even adventurers have limited or no access to it? What if your campaign is set in a version of your own world's history? The world is new. What if the world is new? and the, then the characters are the first of a long line of heroes. The adventurers might be champions of the first great empires, such as the empires of Netheril and Kormantha in the Forgotten Realm setting. The world is known. What if the world is completely charted and mapped, right down to the here there be dragons notations? What if great empires cover huge stretches of countryside, with clearly defined borders between them? The five nations of Eberron setting were once a part of a great empire and magically aided travel between the cities is commonplace. Monsters are uncommon. What if monsters are rare and terrifying? In the Ravenloft setting, horrific domains are governed by monstrous rulers. The populace lives in perpetual terror of these dark lords and their evil minions, but other monsters rarely trouble people's daily lives. Magic is everywhere. What if every town is ruled by a powerful wizard? What if magic item shops are common? The Eberron setting makes the use of magic an everyday occurrence, as magical flying ships and trains carry travellers from one great city to another. Gods inhabit the land or are entirely absent. What if the gods regularly walk the earth? What if the characters can challenge them and seize their power? Or what if the gods are remote and even angels never make contact with the mortals? In the Dark Sun setting, the gods are extremely distant, perhaps non-existent, and clerics rely instead on elemental power for their magic. So there's this one bit about uh, gods being distant. Uh, I mean, obviously I don't want gods to be absent from my... Well, obviously or not so obviously. I don't really want gods to be absent from my... from my campaign. But I like the idea of gods, gods being somewhat far away. A character that is a cleric or a paladin and is faithful to his god is much more interesting if he if he hasn't seen his god face to face if uh, if actually getting a portent from a god like a very cryptic mystical maybe it's like just a stain on a piece of glass maybe it's actually a vision from your god type of deal is much more interesting than the the character contacting the god while in a, a sewer under boulder's gate by just muttering a prayer at at level three cleric that sort of thing, I don't like it at all. It's not very. It takes it. It strips the gods of the world of their of their awe of their epicness of their of the coolness. So 
I know that uh, they they have given that the gods interfere with the world and the mortals as uh, as a core assumption of the standard D&D world. And I know that I plan to do Forgotten Realms, but my take on Forgotten Realms is gonna probably make the gods more hidden. I think the, that, for example, Icewind Dale game, the the RPG, the the non tabletop RPG, the the computer RPG, the Infinity Engine game by by Black Isle, is about right in that regard. You have things named after gods. You have magic items that have interference from gods. You have the like this um, you have this keep that has towers named after the elven pantheon and has shrines to the to the elven gods but the gods never appear in any way in, in the game that distant if you have a cleric well they don't really have a any special subquest for for the religion or they don't talk to the gods strictly speaking you have a you have a temple in the, in the main in, in the main town to the god of the standing what was his name what was his name? Do I need to Google it? You have a shrine to, or a temple. You have a temple to Ulmata and a huge tree sacred to the druids and the in the main town. But uh, these gods, they don't really interfere into the into the story, despite uh, despite the, this druidic sanctuary, the, the the big tree being a big part of the story. I like that. That's just about right for my taste. The way I the way I'm going to depict Forgotten Realms setting in my in my campaign is gonna be similar to to the way it's it's presented in the similar to the way computer games have adapted D and mean specifically the Infinity Engine games and maybe a little bit of inspiration from the Golden Box games, but I don't know these too well. We'll see we'll see how well I can do it. And my players also are gonna have a say in that. We'll try and we'll see and it's Things are never the way you intend them to be, so I'm looking forward to seeing how I can handle it. Gods of your world. Appendix B of the player's handbook presents a number of pantheons, loose groupings of deities not united by a single doctrine or philosophy. For use in your game, including the gods of established D&D worlds and high fantasy historical pantheons, you can adopt one of these pantheons to your campaign, or pick and choose deities and ideas from them as you please. See a sample pantheon in this section for an example. As far as the game's rules are concerned, it doesn't matter if your world has hundreds of deities or a church devoted to a single god. In rules terms, clerics choose domains, not deities, so your world can associate domains with deities in any way you choose. Loose Pantheons Most D&D worlds have a loose pantheon of gods. A multitude of deities rule the various aspects of existence, various cooperating and competing against one another to administer the affairs of the universe. People gather in public shrines to, work, to worship gods of life and wisdom, or meet in hidden places to venerate gods of deception or destruction. Each deity in the pantheon has a portfolio and is responsible for advancing that portfolio. In the Greyhawk setting, Hieronius is a god of valor who calls clerics and paladins to his service and encourages them to spread the ideas of honorable warfare, chivalry and justice in society. Even in the midst of this everlasting war with his brother Hexter, god of war and tyranny, Hieronius promotes his own portfolio, war fought nobly, and in the cause of justice. People in most D&D worlds are polytheistic, honouring deities of their own and acknowledging pantheons of other cultures. Individuals pay homage to various gods regardless of alignment. In the Forgotten Realms, a person might propitate umbrally before setting out to sea, Join a communal feast to celebrate Chantier at harvest time and pray to Malar before going hunting. Some individuals feel a calling to a particular deity's service and claim that God is a patron. Particularly devoted individuals become priests by setting up a shrine or helping to staff a holy site. Much more rarely those who feel such a calling become clerics or paladins invested with the responsibility of a true divine power. Shrines and temples serve as community gathering points for religious rites and festivals. Priests at such sites relate stories of the gods, teach the ethics of their patron deities, offer advice and blessings, perform religious rites and provide training in activities their deities favour. Cities and large towns can host several temples dedicated to individual gods important to the community, while smaller settlements might have a single shrine devoted to any god the locals revere. 
You quickly build a pantheon for your world, create a single god for each of the eight domains available to clerics. Death, knowledge, life, light, nature, tempest, trickery, and war. You can invent names and personalities for these deities, or borrow deities from other pantheons. This approach gives you a small pantheon that covers the most significant aspects of existence and is easy enough to extrapolate other areas of life each deity controls. The god of knowledge, for example, might also be a patron of magic and prophecy, while the god of light could be the sun god and god of time. I like that they suggest that the sun god be a, a god of time because a lot of more primitive cultures can only tell time from the position of the sun. Dawn War Deities Deity Asmodeus, God of Tyranny Alignment, Lawful Evil Suggested Domain Strickery Symbol Three Triangles in Tight Formation Alvandra, Goddess of Change and Luck Alignment, Chaotic God Suggested Domain Strickery Symbol Three Stacked Wavy Lines Bahamut, God of Justice and Nobility Alignment, Lawful God Suggested Domains Life War Symbol Dragon's Head in Profile Facing Left Bane, God of War and Conquest Alignment, Lawful Evil, Suggested Domains, War, Symbol, Claw with three talons pointing down. Corellon, God of Magic and the Arts, Chaotic Good, Domain, Light, Symbol, Eight-Pointed Star, Erathes, Goddess of Civilization and Invention, Lawful Neutral, Domain, Knowledge, Symbol, Upper Half of a Clockwork Gear, Groomsh, God of Destruction, Chaotic Evil, Domain, Tempest, War, Symbol, Triangular Eye with Bony Protrusions, Ayun, Goddess of Knowledge, Neutral, Domain, Knowledge, Symbol, Crook-shaped like a stylized eye, Cord, God of Strength and Storms, Chaotic Neutral, Suggested Domains, Tempest, Symbol, Sword with a Lightning Bolt, Cross Guard, Lolz, Goddess of Spiders and Lies, Chaotic Evil, Suggested Domain, Trickery, Symbol, Eight-Pointed Star with a Web Motive, Melora, Goddess of Wilderness and the Sea, Neutral, Suggested Domains, Nature, Tempest, Symbol, wave like swell, Moradin, god of creation, lawful good, suggested domains, knowledge, war, symbol, flaming anvil, Pelor, god of the sun and agriculture, neutral good, suggested domains, life and light, symbol, circle with six outwardly radiating points, raven queen, goddess of death, alignment, lawful neutral, suggested domains, life, death, symbol, raven's head and profile facing left. Tehenin, Goddess of the Moon, Alignment, Chaotic Neutral, Suggested Domain Trickery, Symbol, Crescent Moon, Tharizdun, God of Madness, Alignment, Chaotic Evil, Suggested Domain Trickery, Symbol, Jagged Counterclockwise Spiral, Tiamat, Goddess of Wealth, Greed and Vengeance, Alignment, Lawful Neutral, Suggested Domains, Trickery and War, Symbol, Five Pointed Star, No, Yes? Five pointed star with curved points, huh? I thought it would be something more draconic. Toror, god of the underdark. Neutral evil, suggested domains, death. Symbol, T attached to a circular, circu circular shackle. Vecna, god of evil secrets. Neutral evil, suggested domains, death, knowledge. Symbol, partially shattered one eyed skull. Zaheer, god of darkness and poison. Alignment, chaotic evil, suggested domains, trickery and death. Symbol, snake in the shape of a dagger. A sample pantheon. The pantheon of the Dawn War is an example of a pantheon assembled from mostly pre-existing elements to suit the needs of a particular campaign. This is the default pantheon in the 4th edition Player's Handbook 2008. The pantheon is summarized in the Dawn War deities table. This pantheon draws in several non-human deities and establishes them as universal gods. These gods include Bahamut, Korolon, Grumsh, Lolf, Moradin, Sehenin, and Tiamat. Humans worship Moradin and Korolon as gods in their respective portfolios rather than as racial deities. The pantheon also includes the archdevil Osmodius as a god of dominion and tyranny. Several of the gods are drawn from other pantheons, sometimes with new names for the gods. Bane comes from Forgotten Realms, from Greyhawk come Cord, Pelo, Tharizdun, and Vecna. From the Greek pantheon come Athena renamed Erathes, and Taiki renamed Avandra, though both are altered. Set renamed Zahir comes from the Egyptian pantheon. The Raven Queen is akin to the Norse pantheon's Hel and Greyhawks, We Jas. That leaves three gods created from scratch Ayun, Melora, and Torog. Other religious systems. In your campaign, you can create pantheons of gods who are closely linked in a single religion. Monotheistic religions 
worship of a single deity, dualistic systems centered on two opposing deities or forces, mystery cults involving personal devotion to a single deity, usually as part of a pantheon system, animistic religions revering the spirits inherent in nature, or even forces and philosophies that don't center on deities. Tight pantheons. In contrast to loose pantheons, a tight pantheon focuses on a single religion whose teachings and edicts embrace a small group of deities. Followers of a tight pantheon might favor one of its member deities over another, but they respect all the deities and honor them with sacrifices and prayer as appropriate. The key trait to a tight pantheon is that its worshippers embrace a single ethos of dogma that includes all the deities. The gods of the tight pantheon work as one to protect and guide their followers. You can think of a tight pantheon as similar to a family. One or two deities who lead the pantheon serve as parent figures, with the rest serving as patrons of important aspects of the culture that worships the pantheon. A single temple honors all members of the pantheon. Most tight pantheons have one or more aberrant gods, deities whose worship isn't sanctioned by the priests of the pantheon as a whole. These are usually evil deities and enemies of the pantheon, such as the Greek titans. These deities have cults of their own, attracting social outcasts and villains to their worships. These cults resemble mystery cults. Their members strictly devoted to their single god. The even members of a barren cult pay lip service in the temples of the tight pantheon. The Norse deities serve as an example of a tight pantheon. Odin is the pantheon's leader and father figure. Deities such as Thor, Tyr, and Freya embody important aspects of Norse culture. Meanwhile, Loki and his devotees lurk in the shadows, sometimes aiding the other deities, and sometimes working against them with the pantheon's enemies. Mystery Cult A mystery cult is a secretive religious organization based on a ritual of initiation in which the initiate is magically identified with a god or a handful of related gods. Mystery cults are intensely personal, concerned with initiate's relationship with the divine. Sometimes a mystery cult is a type of worship within a pantheon. It acknowledges the myths and rituals of the pantheon but presents its own myths and rites as primary. For instance, a secretive order of monks might immerse themselves in a mystical relationship to a god who is a part of a broadly worshipped pantheon. A mystery cult emphasizes the history of its god, which is symbolically reenacted in its initiation ritual. The foundation myth of a mystery cult is usually simple and often involves a god's death and rising or a journey to the underworld and return. Mystery cults often revere sun and moon deities and agricultural deities, gods who, whose portfolios reflect the cycles of nature. The cult's ritual of initiation follows the pattern of its foundation myth. Neophytes retrace the god's footsteps in order to share the god's ultimate fate. In the case of dying and rising gods, the symbolic death of the initiate represents the idea of death to the old life and rebirth into a transformed existence. Initiates are born into a new life, remaining in the world of mortal affairs, but feeling elevated to a higher sphere. The initiate is promised a place in the god's realm after death, but also experiences new meaning in life. Divine Rank The divine beings of the multiverse are often categorized according to their cosmic power. Some gods are worshipped on multiple worlds and have different rank on each world depending on their influence there. Greater deities are beyond mortal understanding. They can't be summoned and they are, off, and they are almost always removed from direct involvement in mortal affairs. On very rare occasions they manifest avatars similar to the lesser deities, but slaying a greater god's avatar has no effect on the god itself. Lesser deities are embodied somewhere in the plains. Some lesser deities li live in the material plane, as does the unicorn goddess Lurue from the Forgotten Realms, and the titanic shard god Sekolach revealed by the Sahuagin. Others live on the outer plane, such as Loth dwells in the abyss. Such deities can be encountered by mortals. Quasi-deities have a divine origin, but they don't hear or answer prayers, grant spells to cleric or control aspects of mortal life. They are still immensely powerful beings, and in theory they could ascend to godhood if they are masked enough worshippers. Quasi-deities fall into three subcategories, demigods, titans and vestiges. Demigods are born from the union of a deity and a mortal being. They have some divine attributes, but their mortal parentage makes them the weakest quasi-deities. Titans are the divine creations of the deities. They might be birthed from the union of two deities, manufactured on divine forged, born from the blood spilled by a god, or otherwise brought about through divine will or substance. Vestiges are deities who have lost nearly all their worshippers and are considered dead from a mortal perspective. 
Esoteric rituals can sometimes contact these beings and draw on their latent power. Monotheism Monotheistic religions revere only one deity and in some cases deny the existence of any other deity. If you introduce a monotheistic religion into your campaign, you need to decide whether other gods exist. Even if they don't, other religions can exist side by side with the monotheistic religion. If these religions have clerics with spellcasting abilities, their spells might be powered by the one true deity, by lesser spirits who are deities, possibly including powerful aberrations, celestial fae, fiends or elementals, or simply by the faith. The deity of a monotheistic religion has an extensive portfolio and is portrayed as the creator of everything, in control of everything and concerned with every aspect of existence. Thus, a worshipper of this god offers prayers and sacrifices to the same god regardless of what aspect of life is in need of divine assistance. Whether marching into war, setting off on a journey, or hoping to win someone's affections, the worshipper prays to the same god. Some monotheistic religions describe different aspects of the deity. A single god appears in different aspects as a creator and a destroyer, and the clerics of that god focus on one aspect or the other, determining their domain, access, and possibly even their alignment on that basis. A cleric who venerates the destroyer aspect chooses the tempest or war domain, while one who worships a creator aspect chooses the life or nature domains. In some monotheistic religions, clerics group themselves into distinct religious orders to differentiate clerics who choose different domains. Dualism. A dualistic religion views the world as the state for a conflict between two diametrically opposed deities or divine forces. Most often the opposed forces are good and evil, or opposed deities represent those forces. In some pantheons, the forces or deities of law and chaos are the fundamental opposites in a dualistic system. Life and death, light and darkness, matter and spirit, body and mind, health and illness, purity and defilement, positive energy and negative energy. The D&D universe is full of polar opposites that could serve as the foundation for a dualistic religion. Whenever the terms in which the dualism is expressed, half of the pair is usually believed to be good, beneficial, desirable or holy, while the other half is considered bad if not explicitly evil. If the fundamental conflict in a religion is expressed as the opposition between matter and spirit, the followers of that religion believe that one of the two, usually matter, is evil and the other, spirit, is good, and so seek to liberate their spirits from this material world and its evils through asceticism and contemplation. Rare dualistic systems believe that the two opposing forces must remain in balance, always pulling away from each other but remaining bound together in creative tension. In cosmology defined by an eternal conflict between good and evil, mortals are expected to take sides. The majority of those who follow a dualistic religion worship the deity or force identified as good. Worshippers of the good deity trust themselves to that god's power to protect them from the evil deity's minions, because the evil deity in such a religion is usually the source of everything that is detrimental to existence. Only the perverse and depraved worship this god. Monsters and fiends serve it, as do certain secretive cults. The myths of a dualistic religion usually predict that the good deity will triumph in an apocalyptic battle, but the forces of evil believe that the outcome of that battle isn't predetermined and work to promote their deity's victory. Deities in a dualistic system maintain large portfolios. All aspects of its existence reflect the dualistic struggle, and therefore all things can fall on one side or the other of the conflict. Agriculture, mercy, the sky, medicine and poetry reside in the portfolio of the good deity, and famine, hatred, disease and war belong to the evil deity. Wouldn't it be cool if you had this sort of conflict and you had this prophesized cataclysmic battle between the god of good and the god of evil and everybody knew that it is set in stone it's prophesized that good will triumph in that conflict and in reality it's all true but the part that it is prophesized that the good will win you could have like a secret inner ring of priests that are the only ones who know that this part has been fabricated by by the cult to to keep the faith strong, to keep the people good, to keep the people moral, to make them side on the on the right side, and by fabricating this prophecy, they want to make a to make a to make it a reality. But maybe in the later ages, the church of the god becomes lax and weak due to this, because they think that no matter how dark it, it is, no matter how bad it becomes, it is prophesied that we will win, and. This starts to become a problem for, for the church. 
Wouldn't be cool. Well, I don't want to make a world of my own anytime soon. Not for Dungeons and Dragons at least. But it's an interesting idea. Animism. Animism is the belief that spirits inhabit every part of the natural world. In an animistic worldview, everything has a spirit from the grandest mountain to the lowliest rock, from the great ocean to bubbling brook, from the sun and moon to a fighter's ancestral sword. All these objects and the spirits that inhabit them are sentient, though some are more aware, alert and intelligent th than others. The most powerful spirits might even be considered deities. All are worthy of respect if not veneration. Animus don't typically pay allegiance to one spirit over the others. Instead, they offer prayers and sacrifices to different spirits at different times, as appropriate to the situation. A pious character might make daily prayers and offerings to ancestor spirits and the spirits of the house, regular petitions to important spirits such as seven fortunes of good luck, occasional sacrifices of incense to location spirits such as the spirit of the forest, and sporadic prayers to a host, to a host of other spirits as well. An animistic religion, very. Wait, what? That's uh, that sentence is written wrong. So it should be probably an animistic religion is very tolerant. Most spirits don't care to whom a character also offers sacrifices, as long as they receive the sacrifices and respect they are due. As new religions spread through animist lands, these religions typically win ad win adherents, but not converts. People incorporate new spirits and deities into their prayers without displacing the old ones. Contemplatives and scholars adopt complex philosophical systems and practices without changing their belief in and respect for the spirits they already venerate. Animism functions as a large, tight pantheon. Animist clerics serve the pantheon as a whole and can so choose any domain representing a favored spirit of that cleric. Forces and philosophies. Not all divine powers need to be derived from deities. In some campaigns, Believers hold enough conviction in their ideas about the universe that they gain magical power from that conviction. In other campaigns, impersonal forces of nature or magic replace the gods by granting power to mortals attuned to them. Just as druids and rangers can gain their spell ability from the force of nature rather than from a specific nature deity, some clerics devote themselves to a deal rather than to a god. Paladins might serve a philosophy of justice and chivalry rather than a specific deity. Forces and philosophies aren't worshipped, there aren't beings that can hear and respond to prayers or accept sacrifices. Devotion to a philosophy or a force isn't necessarily exclusive of a service to a deity. I'd like to say that it would be nice if art as, a, as an ideal could hear me swear at perspective, how I hate perspective. But like they say it here, philosophies and ideals are a personal call and they do not listen to our gripes and prayers. Devotion to a philosophy or a force isn't necessarily exclusive of service to a deity. A person can be dev devoted to the philosophy of good and offer worship to various good deities or revere the forces of nature and also pay homage to the gods of nature who might be seen as personal manifestations of an impersonal force. In a world that includes deities with demonstrable powers through their clerics, it's unusual for a philosophy to deny the existence of deities, although a common philosophical belief states that deities are more like mortals than they would have mortals believe. According to such philosophies, the gods aren't truly immortal, just very long-lived, and mortals can attain divinity. In fact, ascending to godhood is the ultimate goal of some philosophies. The power of a philosophy stems from the belief that mortals invest in it. A philosophy that only one person believes isn't strong enough to bestow magical power on that person. I wish it could be. I have a, I have strong belief in some philosophies and I'd like for it to bestow magical power to me. But I can't do magic so I guess it doesn't work that way. And it says so in the book, Humanoids and the Gods. When it comes to the gods, humans exhibit a far wider range of beliefs and institutions than other races do. In many D&D settings, orcs, elves, dwarves, goblinoids and other humanoids have tight pantheons. It is expected that an orc will worship Gromsh, or one of a handful of subordinate deities. In comparison, humanity embraces a staggering variety of deities. Each human culture might have its own array of gods. In most D&D settings, there is no single god that can claim to have created humanity. Thus, the human proclivity for building institutions extends to religion. A single charismatic prophet can convert an entire kingdom to the worship of a new god. With that prophet's death, religion might wax or wane. The prophet's followers might turn against one another, 
and found several competing religions. In comparison, religion and dwarven society is set in stone. The dwarves of Forgotten Realms identify Moradin as their creator. While individual dwarves might follow other gods as a culture, the dwarves are pledged to Moradin and the pantheon he leads. His teachings and magic are so thoroughly ingrained in dwarven culture that it would take a cataclysmic shift to replace him. With that in mind, consider the role of the gods in your world and their ties to humanoid races. Does each race have a creator god? Or does that god shape that race's culture? Are other folk free of such divine ties and free to worship as they wish? Has a race turned against the god that created it? Has a new race appeared created by a god within the past few years? A deity might also have ties to a kingdom, noble line or other cultural institution. With the death of the emperor, a new ruler might be selected by divine portents, sent by the deity who protected the empire in its earliest days. In such a land, the worship of other gods might be outlawed or tightly controlled. Finally, consider the difference between gods who are tied to specific humanoid races and gods with more diverse followers. Do the races with their own pantheons enjoy a place of privilege in your world, with their gods taking an active role in their affairs? Are the other races ignored by the gods, or are these races the deciding factor that can tilt the balance of power in favor of one god or another? Mapping your campaign When creating the world where your campaign takes place, you'll want a map. You can take one of two approaches with it, top down or bottom up. Some DMs like the start of the talk, creating the big picture of the world at the start of the campaign by having a map that shows whole continents, and then zooming in on smaller areas. Other DMs prefer to go the opposite direction, starting with a small campaign area that is mapped at a province or kingdom scale, then zooming out as adventurers take the characters into new territory. Whichever approach you take, hexes work well for mapping outdoor environments where travel can go in any direction and calculating distance might be important. A single sheet of hex paper with 5 hexes to the inch is ideal for most maps. Use a scale for your map that's best suited to the level of detail you want. Chapter 7 offers more information about creating and mapping wilderness areas. I'm pretty bad with, with units of, of length and measuring things, estimating how long something would take. We're not gonna do a, a map of our own continent. We're gonna play in Dungeons and Dragons. No, <laughs> we're gonna play in Forgotten Realms, I meant. Uh, we're gonna play in Forgotten Realms, so we won't be drawing new continents. But we might have to do a map of smaller scale. Ideally, I would not do it. Ideally, I would just use maps for combat, only for combat, and keep everything else theater of the mind, and not have situations where players are racing against time in, in the scale of a, of a large map, and you have to calculate speed but it's probably going to be useful or informative at least so we'll read through that and incidentally i'm not very good with inches feet and bananas as units of measurement so that's an additional problem they mentioned they mentioned two approaches going top down or bottom up my approach would probably be starting with a story not with a map but with a story and then thinking to myself what's the bare minimum the most bare bones stuff that you need to tell this story map wise and then draw that and if you need something more after that you can just expand at the borders or you can just wait until your story becomes longer until your story has more developments to it and you know what's going to happen or well, you never know what's going to happen because there's players, but you know what you'd like to happen and draw maps for these events. Province scale. For the most detailed areas of the world, use a province scale where each hex represents one mile. A full page map of this scale represents an area that can be covered in one day's travel in any direction from the center of the map, assuming clear terrain. As such, province scale is useful scale for mapping a campaign's starting area. See creating a campaign later in this chapter, or any location where we expect to track the adventurer's movement in hours rather than days. The ground cover of an area this size will include broad stretches of one predominant terrain type, broken up by isolated terrain types. A settled region mapped at this scale might have one town and 8 to 12 villages or farming hamlets. A wilder region might have only a single keep or no settlements at all. You can also indicate the extent of the cleared farmland that surrounds each city or town. On the province scale map, this will show as a belt a few hexes wide, 
surrounding each town or village. Even small villages farm most of the arable land within a mile or two. On the kingdom scale map, each hex represents 6 miles. A map of this scale covers a large region about the size of Great Britain, or half the size of the state of California. That's plenty of room for adventuring. The first step of mapping a region at this scale is to sketch out the coastlines and any major bodies of water in the area. Is the region landlocked or on a coast? A coastal region might include islands offshore, and a landlocked area might include an inland sea or major lakes. Alternatively, the region could consist of a single large island or an isthmus or peninsula with multiple coastlines. Next, sketch in any major mountain ranges. Foothills form a transition between the mountains and lowlands, and broad porches, patches, porches, that would be a good word, porches. Foothills form a transition between mountains and lowlands, and broad patches of gentle hills might dot the region. That leaves the rest of your map to relatively flat terrain. Grasslands, forests, swamps and the like. Place these elements as you see fit. Map out the courses of any rivers that flow through the area. Rivers are born in mountains or inland areas that see a lot of rainfall, winding down to the nearest major body of water that doesn't require the river to cross over high elevation. Tributaries join rivers as they grow larger and move toward a lake or the sea. Finally, place the major towns and cities of the region. At this scale you don't need to worry about small towns and villages or mapping every belt of farmland. Even so, a settlement region of this size might easily have 8 to 12 cities or towns to put on the map. Continent scale for mapping a whole continent, use a scale where one hex represents 60 miles. At this scale, you can't see more than the shape of coastlines, the biggest mountain ranges, major rivers, huge lakes, and political boundaries. A map at this scale is best for showing how multiple kingdom scale maps fit together, rather than tracking the movement of adventurers day by day. The same process you use for mapping a region at kingdom scale works for mapping a whole continent. A continent might have 8 to 12 large cities that deserve a place on the map, most likely major trade centers and the capitals of kingdoms. Combining scales. Whichever scale you start with, it's easy to zoom in or out on your maps. At continent scale, one hex represents the same area as 10 kingdom scale hexes. Two cities that are 3 hexes or 180 miles apart on your continent map would be 30 hexes apart on your kingdom map and might define the opposite ends of the region you're detailing. At kingdom scale, one hex equals six province scale hexes, so it's easy to put the region covered by your province scale map into the center of a kingdom scale map and create interesting areas around it. Settlements. The places where people live, bustling cities, prosperous towns, and tiny villages nestled, mm, nestled, good word. The places where people live, bustling cities, prosperous towns, and tiny villages nestled among miles of farmland help to find the nature of civilization in your world. A single settlement, a home base for adventurers, is a great place to start a campaign and begin your world building. Consider the following questions as you create any settlement in your world. What purpose does it serve in your game? How big is it? Who lives there? What does it look, smell and sound like? Who governs it? Who else holds power? Is it part of a larger state? What are its defenses? Where do characters go to find the goods and services they need? What temples and other organizations feature prominently? What fantastic elements distinguish it from an ordinary town? Why should the characters care about the settlement? The guidelines in this section are here to help you build the settlement you want, for whatever purpose you have in mind. Disregard any advice here that runs counter to your vision for the settlement. Purpose the Settlement exists primarily to facilitate the story and fun of your campaign. Other than that point, a settlement's purpose determines the amount of detail you put into it. Create only the features of a settlement that you know you'll need, along with notes and general features. Then allow the place to grow organically as the adventurers interact with more and more of it, keeping notes on new places you invent. Local Collar A settlement might serve as a place where the characters stop to rest and buy new supplies. A settlement might serve as a place where the characters stop to rest and buy supplies. A settlement of this sort needs no more than a brief description. Include the settlement's name, decide how big it is, add a dash of flavor. The smell of the local tanneries never lifts from this town, for example, and let the adventurers get on with their business. The history of the inn where the characters spent their night, the mannerisms of shopkeeper, they buy supplies from, 
you can add this level of detail, but you don't have to. If the characters return to the same settlement, start adding these local features so that it begins to feel a little more like a home base, albeit a temporary one. Let the settlement develop as the need arises. Home base. A settlement gives the adventurers a place to live, train and recuperate between adventures. An entire campaign can center on a particular town or city. Such a settlement is a launching pad from which the characters go out into the wider world. Designed well, home base can hold a special place in the adventurers' hearts, particularly if they care about one or more NPCs who live there. To make a home base come alive, you will need to invest some time fleshing out details, but the players can help you with that work. Ask them to tell you a bit about mentors, family members, and other important people in the characters' lives. Feel free to add to and modify what they give you, but it will start as a solid foundation of the non-player characters and PCs who are important to the characters. Let the players describe where and how their characters spend their time, a favorite tavern, library or temple perhaps. Oh, so they mean quite literally for the players to help you build it. I don't think I'd do that personally, because, well, here's the thing, if this were to happen before any single game in that campaign, and they wanted to have this particular town or city as a, as a point of origin or some place that they have been or spent some time or trained or worked, whatever. And they would like to include some extra detail uh, where I they visit this shop or tavern. This guy would be their mentor. Like I'm absolutely down for that. But if this were in the middle in the middle of the campaign, I probably wouldn't ask them for input on this because. It kind of takes away, if you give your players agency over the world, it kind of takes away of them being just this one character in the world, right? If you're just one character in the world, and then you, you ask basically about, by your DM about how this world should be, it kind of makes you step out of the shoes of that single character, and I don't want that, and I wouldn't want that as a player either, to be asked, I guess. I, like, the, the primary, the pri sorry. Uh, the primary argument here is that basically I wouldn't want to be asked as a player, so I'm, I, I wouldn't ask my players in this situation. But let's continue reading this take. Using these NPCs and locations as a starting point, flesh out the settlement's cast of characters, detail its leadership, including law enforcement discussed later in the chapter, include characters who can provide information such as sages, soothsayers, librarians, and observant vagabonds. Priests can provide spellcasting as well as information. Make note of merchants who might regularly interrupt the adventurers and perhaps compete with one another for the party's business. Think about the people who run the adventurers' favorite tavern, and then add a handful of wild cards, a shady dealer, a mad prophet, a retired mercenary, a drunken rake, or anyone else who adds a dash of adventure and intrigue to your campaign. Adventure Site A village harboring a secret cult of devil worshippers, a town controlled by a guild of were-rats, a city conquered by a hobgoblin army. These settlements aren't merely rest stops but locations where adventures unfold. In a settlement that doubles as an adventure location, details the intended adventure areas such as towers and warehouses. For an event-based adventure, note the NPCs who play a part in the adventure. This work is adventure preparation as much as it is world building, and the cast of characters you develop for your adventure include allies, patrons, enemies and extras can become recurring figures in your campaign. Size. Most settlements in D&D world are villages clustered around a larger town or city. Farming villages supply the town or city population with food in exchange for goods the farmers can't produce themselves. Towns and cities are seats of the nobles who govern the surrounding area and who carry the responsibility of defending the villages from attack. Occasionally, a local lord or lady lives in a keep or fo fortress with no nearby town or city, village, population up to 1,000, government, a noble, usually not a resident, rules the village with an appointed agent, a reeve, in residence, to adjudicate disputes and collect taxes. Defense. The reeve might have a small force of soldiers, otherwise the village relies on a citizen militia. Commerce. Basic supplies are readily available, possibly from an inn or a trading post. Other goods are available from travelling merchants. 
organizations. The village might contain one or two temples or shrines, but few or no other organizations. Most settlements are agricultural villages, supporting themselves in nearby towns or cities with crops and meat. The villagers produce food in one way or another. If not by tending the crops and supporting those who do by shoeing horses, weaving clothes, milling grain and the like. The goods they produce feed their families and supply trade with nearby settlements. A village's population is dispersed around a large area of land. Farmers live on their land, which spreads them wide widely around the village centre. At the heart of the village, a handful of structures cluster together. A well, a marketplace, a small temple or two, a gathering place and perhaps an inn for travellers. Town Population up to 6,000. Government. A resident noble rules and appoints a lord mayor to oversee administration. An elected town council represents the interests of the middle class. Defense. The noble commands a sizable army of professional soldiers as well as personal bodyguards. Commerce. Basic supplies are readily available. Their exotic goods and services are harder to find. Inns and taverns for travelers. Organizations. The town contains several temples as well as various merchant guilds and other organizations. Towns are major trade centers, situated where important industries and reliable trade routes enable the population to grow. These settlements rely on commerce, the import of raw materials and food from surrounding villages, and the export of crafted items to those villages, as well as to other towns and cities. The town's population is more diverse than that of most villages. Towns arise where roads intersect waterways, at the meeting of major land trade routes, around strategic defensive locations, or near significant mines or similar natural resources. City. Population up to 25,000. Government. A resident noble presides with several other nobles sharing responsibility for surrounding areas and government functions. One such noble is the Lord Mayor who oversees the city administration. An elected city council represents the middle class and might hold more actual power than the Lord Mayor. Other groups serve as important power centers as well. Defense. The city supports an army of professional soldiers, guards and town watch. Each noble and residence maintains a small force of personal bodyguards. Commerce. Almost any goods or services are readily available. Many inns and taverns support travelers. Organizations. A multitude of temples, guilds and other organizations, some of which hold significant power in city affairs, can be found within the city's walls. Cities are cradles of civilization. Their larger populations require considerable support from both surrounding villages and trade routes, so they are rare. Cities typically thrive in areas where large expanses of fertile, arable land, land surround the location accessible to trade, almost always on a navigable waterway. Cities almost always have walls, and the stages of a city's growth are easily identified by the expansion of the walls beyond the central core. These internal walls naturally divide the city into wards. Neighborhoods, defined by specific features, which have their own representatives on the city council and their own noble administrators. Cities that hold more than 25,000 people are extremely rare. Metropolises such as Waterdeep in the Forgotten Realms, Sharn in Eberron, and the free city of Greyhawk stand as vital beacons of civilization in the D&D world. Atmosphere what do the adventurers first notice as they approach or enter a settlement? The towering wall bristling with soldiers, the beggars with hands outstretched ple pleading for aid outside the gate, the noisy hubbub of merchants and buyers thronging the market square, the overpowering stench of manure, hubbub, good word. Sensory details help bring a settlement to life and vividly communicate its personality to your players. Settle on a single defining factor that sums up a settlement's personality and extrapolate from there. Maybe a city is built around canals, like real-world Venice. That key element suggests a wealth of sensory details. The sight of colorful boats floating on muddy waters, the sound of lapping waves and perhaps singing gondoliers, the smell of fish and waste polluting the water, the feel of humidity, or perhaps the city is shrouded in fog much of the time, and you describe the tendrils of cold mist reaching through every crack and cranny. The muffled sounds of hooves on cobblestones, the cold air with the smell of rain, and the sense of mystery and lurking danger. The climate and terrain of a settlement's environment, its origin and inhabitants, its government and political position, and its commercial importance all have a bearing on its overall atmosphere. 
A city nestled against the edge of jungle has a very different feel than one on the edge of a desert. Nestled, good word. Elf and dwarf cities present a distinct aesthetic, clearly identifiable in contrast to human-built ones. Soldiers patrol the streets to quell any hint of dissent in a city ruled by a tyrant, while a city fostering an early system of democracy might boast an open-air market where philosophical ideas are traded as freely as produce. All the possible combinations of these factors can inspire endless variety in settlements of your campaign world. Government In the feudal society common in most D&D worlds, power and authority are concentrated in towns and cities. Nobles hold authority over the settlements where they live and the surrounding lands. They collect taxes from the populace which they use for public building projects, to pay the soldiery and to support a comfortable lifestyle for themselves. Although nobles often have considerable hereditary wealth, in exchange they promise to protect their citizens from threats such as orc marauders, hobgoblin armies and ro roving human bandits. Nobles appoint officers as their agents in villages to supervise the collection of taxes and serve as judges in disputes and criminal trials. These reeves, sheriffs or bailiffs are commoners native to the villages they govern chosen for their positions because they already hold the respect of their fellow citizens. Within towns and cities, lords share authority and administrative responsibility with lesser nobles, usually their own relatives, and also with representatives of the middle class such as traders and artisans. A lord mayor of noble birth is appointed to head the town or city council and to perform the same administrative functions that reeves carry out in villages. The council consists of representatives elected by the middle class. Only foolish nobles ignore the wishes of their councils, since the economic power of the middle class is often more important to the prosperity of a town or city than the hereditary authority of the nobility. I think that part is kind of different than the reality of, of these sort of political systems in, in ages past. Nobles basically used to do whatever they wanted. The larger a settlement, the more likely that other individuals or organizations hold significant power there as well. Even in the village, a popular individual, a wise elder or, low, or a well-liked farmer can wield more influence than the appointed reeve, and a wise reeve avoids making an enemy of such a person. In towns and cities, the same power might lie in the hands of a prominent temple, a guild independent of the council, or an individual with magical power. Forms of government. A settlement rarely stands alone. A given town or city might be a theocratic city-state or a prosperous free city, governed by a merchant council. More likely, it's a part of a feudal kingdom, a bureaucratic empire, or a remote realm ruled by an iron-fisted tyrant. Consider how your settlement fits into the bigger picture of your world or region, who rules its ruler, and what other settlements might also lie under its control. Forms of government. That's our D100 table. 1 to 8, autocracy. 9 to 13, bureaucracy. 14 to 19, confederacy. 20 to 22, democracy. 23 to 27, dictatorship. 28 to 42, feudalism. 43 to 44, gerontocracy. 45 to 53, hierarchy. 54 to 56, Magocracy, 57 to 58, matriarchy. Should like should it be magocracy or majocracy, or magiocracy? I'm not sure how to read. That's a that's a very difficult one. 51 to 64, militio militia. Oh dear God, militiocracy, militiocracy. Mil uh, this is like militia or just turn into a. T I don't know. 59 to 64, militiocracy, militiocracy. Difficult word. 65 5 to 74, monar monarchy. <laughs> I almost read it as monarchy. <laughs> monarchy, of course. 75 to 78, oligarchy. 79 to 80, patriarchy. 81 to 83, meritocracy. 84 to 85, plutocracy. 86 to 92, republic. 93 to 94, satrapy. 95, kleptocracy. 96 to 100, theocracy. Typical and fantastical forms of government are described below. Choose one or randomly determine a form of government for a nation or city from the forms of government table. Autocracy. One hereditary ruler wields absolute power. The autocrat either is supported by a well-developed bureaucracy or military or stands as the only authority in an otherwise anarchic society. 
their dynastic ruler could be immortal or undead. Ondair and Karnath, two kingdoms in the Eberon campaign setting, have autocrats with royal blood in their veins, whereas Queen Aurala of Ondair relies on wizards and spies to enforce her will. Caius, the vampire king of Karnath, has a formidable army of living and undead soldiers under his command. Bureaucracy Various departments composed the government, each responsible for an aspect of rule. The department heads, ministers or secretaries answer to a figurehead, autocrat or council. Confederacy Each individual city or town within the confederacy governs itself, but all contribute to a league or federation that promotes, at least in theory, the common good of all member states. Conditions and aptitudes towards the central government vary from place to place within the confederacy. The Lord's Alliance in the Forgotten Realms setting is a loose confederacy of cities, while the Mroor Hall in the Eberron campaign setting is a confederacy of allied dwarf clans. Democracy Citizens or their elected representatives determine the laws in a democracy. A bureaucracy or military carries out the day-to-day -day work of government, with positions filled through open elections. Dictatorship One supreme ruler holds absolute authority, but his or her rule isn't necessarily dynastic. In other respects, this resembles an autocracy. In the Greyhawk campaign setting, a half-demon named Eus is the dictator of a conquered land that bears his name. Feudalism The typical government of Europe in the Middle Ages, a feudalistic society, consists of layers of lords and vassals. The vassals provide soldiers, or scutage, payment in lieu of military service, to the lords, who in turn promise protection to the vassals. Gerontocracy. Elders preside over this society. In some cases, long-lived races such as elves or dragons are entrusted with the leadership of the land. Hierarchy. A feudal or bureaucratic government where every member except one is subordinate to another member. In the Dragonlance campaign setting, the dragon armies of Kryn form a military hierarchy with the dragon high lords as the leaders under the dragon queen Takhesis. Kleptocracy. This government is composed of groups or individuals primarily seeking wealth for themselves, often at the expense of their subjects. The grasping banded kingdoms in the Greyhawk campaign setting are prime examples. A kingdom run by the thieves' guilds would also fall into this category. But this is basically what we have in the real world, I guess, kleptocracy. Magocracy. The governing body is composed of spellcasters who rule directly as oligarchs or feudal lords, or participate in a democracy or bureaucracy. Examples include the Red Wizards of Fae in the Forgotten Realms and the Sorcerer Kings of Arthas in the Dark Sun campaign setting. It was a joke, by the way, the part about cryptocracy being the most popular system in the real world. world. Although the part where, um, where the politicians have their own wealth as the primary goal and they don't mind beefing that up at the cost of their subjects is kind of true a lot of the time. I don't mean to knock you down if you're a politician listening to this, but... Uh, yeah, I hate to break it to you, it's often that way. Matriarchy or Patriarchy This society is governed by the eldest or most important members of one gender. Drow cities are examples of theocratic matriarchies, for each is ruled by a council of drow high priestesses who answer to Lolth, the demon queen of spiders. Meritocracy The most intelligent and educated people oversee the society, often with bureaucracy, to handle the day-to-day -day work of government. In the Forgotten Realms, scholarly monks preside over the fortress library of Candlekeep, overseen by a master of law called the Keeper. Militocracy Military leaders run the nation under martial law, using the army and other armed forces. A militocracy might be based on an elite group of soldiers, an order of dragon riders, or a league of sea princes. Salamnia a nation ruled by knights in the Dragonlance campaign setting falls into this category. Monarchy A single hereditary sovereign wears the crown. Unlike the autocrat, the monarch's powers are limited by law, and the ruler serves as the head of a democracy, feudal state or militocracy. The kingdom of Breland in the Eberron campaign setting has both a parliament that makes laws and a monarch who enforces them. Oligarchy a small number of absolute rulers share power, possibly dividing the land into districts or provinces under their control, or jointly ruling together. A group of adventurers who take control of a nation together 
might form an oligarchy. The free city of Greyhawk is an oligarchy composed of various faction leaders, with a Lord Mayor as its figurehead. Plutocracy Society is governed by the wealthy. The elite form a ruling council, purchase representation at the court of a figurehead monarch, or ruled by default because money is the true power in the realm. Many cities in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, including Waterdeep and Baldur's Gate, are pl plutocracies. Republic Government is entrusted to representatives of an established electorate who rule on behalf of the electors. Any democracy in which only landowners or certain classes can vote could be considered a republic. Satrapy Conquerors and representatives of another government wield power, ruling the settlement or a region as part of a larger empire. The satraps are bureaucrats and military officers, or unusual characters or monsters. The cities of Highport and Zuderham in Greyhawk campaign setting are satrapies controlled by agents of a vicious gang of marauders known as the Slave Lords. Theocracy Rulership falls to a direct representative or a collection of agents of a deity. The centers of power in a theocracy are usually located on sacred sites. In the Eberron campaign setting, the nation of Thrain is a theocracy devoted to the Silver Flame, a divine spirit that resides in Thrain's capital of Flamekeep. Simple Hierarchy of Noble Titles Rank 1 Rank 1st Title Emperor Empress 2nd King Queen 3rd Duke Duchess 4th Prince Princess 5th Marquess Marquise 6th Earl or Count or Countess 7th Vicant or Vicountess 8th Baron or Baroness, 9th Baronet, 10th Knight. Commerce Even small villages can provide characters access to the gear they need to pursue their adventures. Provisions, tents, backpacks, and simple weapons are commonly available. Traveling merchants carry armor, martial weapons, and other specialized gear. Most villages have inns that cater to travelers, where adventurers can find a hot meal and a bed even if the quality leaves much to be desired. Villagers rely heavily on trade with other settlements, including larger towns and cities. Merchants pass through regularly, selling necessities and luxuries to the villagers, and any successful merchant has far-reaching contacts across the region. Traveling merchants pass on gossip and adventure hooks to the characters as they conduct their business, since merchants make their living traversing roads that might be menaced by bandits or wandering monsters, they hire guards to keep their goods safe. They also carry news from town to town, including reports of situations that cry out for the attention of adventurers. These merchants can't provide the services normally found in the city, for instance when the characters are in need of a library or a dedicated sage, a trainer who can handle the griffin eggs they found, or an architect to design their castle. They're better off going to a large city than looking in a village. Well, maybe with the, with the Griffin eggs, they'd have more luck in a rural region, but for most of these, I kind of, seem, I kind of think I agree. Uh, currency. The straightforward terms gold piece, GP, silver piece, SP, copper piece, CP, electron piece, EP, and platinum piece, PP, are used throughout the game rules for clarity. You can imbue the denominations with more interesting descriptions in your game world. People give coins specific names, whether as plain as dime, or as lively as gold double eagle. A country typically mints its own currency, which might correspond to the basic rules terms. In most worlds, few currencies achieve widespread distribution, but nearly all coins are accepted worldwide, except by those looking to pick a fight with a foreigner. I like that the uh, platinum piece is a PP. Example. The Forgotten Realms. The world of Forgotten Realms provides an extensive example of currencies, although barter, blood notes, and similar letters of trade are common enough in Faerun. Metal coins and trade bars are the everyday currency. Common coinage. Coins appear in a bewildering variety of shapes, sizes, names and materials. Thanks to the ambitious traders of Sambia, that nation's oddly shaped coins can be found throughout Faerun. In Sambia, square, iron, steel pens replace copper coins, triangular silver pieces are ravens, diamond-shaped electron pieces are har marks, commonly called the blue eyes, and five-sided gold pieces are nobles. Sambia doesn't mint platinum coins. All coinage is accepted in Sambia, including copper and platinum pieces from abroad.
In Waterdeep, the bustling cosmopolitan center of trade, coppers are called nibs. Silvers are shards, electron pieces are moons, gold pieces are dragons, and platinum coins are suns. The city's two local coins are the toll and the harbor moon. The toll is a square brass trading coin pierced with a central hole to permit it to be easily strung on a ring or string, worth two GP in the city and nothing outside Waterdeep. The harbor moon is a flat crescent of platinum, with central hole in an electrum inlay named for its tradition use in the docks for buying large amounts of cargo at once. The coin is worth 50 GP in Waterdeep and 30 GP elsewhere. The northern city of Silver Moon mints a crescent shaped shiny blue coin called an Electrum Moon, worth 1 GP in that city and 1 EP elsewhere. The city also issues a larger coin called an Eclipse Moon, which looks like an Electrum Moon combined a darker silver wedge. I think they meant to write combined with a darker silver wedge to form a round coin worth 5 Electrum pieces within the city and 2 Electrum pieces outside it. The favorite form of currency in the Kingdom of Cormyr is the large coinage of the court stamped with a dragon on one side and a treasury date mark on the other. There, coppers are called thumbs, silvers are silver falcons, electron pieces are blue eyes, gold pieces are golden lions, and platinum coins are tri-crowns. Even city-states mint their own copper, silver, and gold pieces. Electron and platinum pieces are rarer in those lands. Smaller states use coinage borrowed from other nations and looted from ancient sources. Travelers from certain lands, notably the wizard-dominated realms of Tse and Hyrua, use the currencies of other realms when trading abroad because their own coins and tokens are feared to be magically cursed and so are shunned by others. Conversely, the coins of long-lost legendary lands and centers of great magic are honored though those who find them are wise to sell them to collectors rather than merely spending them in markets. The coins of the old elven court of Cormantia are particularly famous. Talvers, coppers, bedoirs, silvers, samarks, electrum, shilmers, gold, and ruendils, platinum. These coins are fine, numerous, and sometimes still used in trade among elves. So this, we have the metals here. It's not specific coins, but it says it like they have different colors and this is the copper this is a gold coin this is an electrum coin this is a silver coin and this is a platinum piece a pp Let's see here that's like the illustration of the pp trade bars large numbers of coins can be difficult to transport and account for many merchants prefer to use trade bars ingots of precious metals and alloys usually silver likely to be accepted by virtually anyone. Trade bars are stamped or graven with the symbol of trading company or government that originally crafted them. These bars are valued by weight as follows. A 2 pound silver bar is worth 10 GP and is about 5 inches long, 2 inches wide and half an inch thick. A 5 pound silver bar is worth 25 GP and is about 6 inches long, 2 inches wide and 1 inch thick. A 5 pound gold bar is worth 250 GP and is about the size of a 2 pound silver bar. The city of Baldur's Gate mints large numbers of silver trade bars and sets the standard for this form of currency. The city of Nirabar issues black iron spindle shaped trade bars with squared ends weighing about 2 pounds each worth 10 GP in that city, markedly less in nearby trade centers and this iron is normally valued elsewhere when this people round. Old currency Coins and bars aren't the only form of hard currency. Gold bells are small brass bells worth 10 GP in trade or 20 GP to a temple of gold. Shah rings, pierced and polished slices of ivory threaded onto strings by the nomads of the Shah, are worth 3 GP per slice. This reminds me that this description of, the, of these ivory threaded strings reminds me of a currency that I've seen in a, in a movie once. It was a movie about Genghis Khan, I think the title was with Mongol, when the main character was a slave in a in a now non-existent country, I assume, in in, in some ancient kingdom that's probably right now on the territory of China. The people there would trade with with something that looks 
very much like this description. They had these strings of beads, and when they would pay for something, for example, when a when a wealthy man bought the the titular character, he would remove a couple of strings from his belt and throw it to the merchant, and the merchant would take it basically because this was the, the coinage. And you could probably take a string apart if you need to pay less. And it wasn't metal, it wasn't strings of, of, of coins with, uh, with holes in them, or metal coins with holes in them. It looked like ivory, so I guess there is a real life thing, or there used to be a real life thing that this is inspired by. And if it isn't, like, that's, a, that's an insane coincidence. Creating your own. As shown in the previous examples, currency doesn't need to obey a universal standard in your world. Each country and era can have its own coins with its own values. Your adventurers might travel through many different lands and find long lost treasures. Finding 600 ancient bedouas from the rule of Coronel El Tagrim 12 centuries before offers a deeper sense of immersion in your world than finding 60 SP. I guess it does, but uh, it's, it's not free. It's very easy to get lost in these names and how many coins of a particular type are there to a single coin of, a, of another type. Worst of all, if you start using two types of coins made from the same metal and uh, different because they've been minted by different countries. Like, it's asking for trouble. I, I, I already no longer remember the names and the uh, values of the coins that I just read about. And trust me, your players are probably going to forget this quite often too. So while I do appreciate the, the texture, the flavor it adds to your world to have these cool coin names, I'd be hesitant to, to put them into my campaign. Probably maybe just a single set, right? Pick a, pick a country. For me, it's going to be um, Kalimshan in my mini campaign, but after that I want to do a real normal side campaign and in that we're, we're probably gonna play in, in the Sword Coast and if my players are gonna keep to or to a single city region I might just learn the names of that one city and use coins from that one but I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I will do even as much because you know it's very easy to forget and trying to crunch down on, uh, on how much the stuff you're carrying in your inventory is actually worth during a game it, it slows it down and it's not exactly very fun varying names and descriptions of coins for varying names and descriptions of coins for the major contemporary and historical realms of your world adds an additional layer of texture the golden lions of Cormier convey the noble nature of that kingdom if a nation mints gold coins stamped with leering demonic faces and called torment that currency expresses a distinct flavor uh, well i don't know why any country would do that but i guess you do you countries you do you creating new coins connected to specific locations like tolls of Waterdeep or the eclipsed moons of silvery moon provides another level of detail as long as you keep the value of these new coins simple in other words don't invent a coin worth 1.65 1.62 sorry gp you add local flavor to key locations in your world without adding undue complexity well you still add a little bit of undue complexity and that's what worries me languages and dialects when fleshing out your world you can create new languages and dialects to reflect its unique geography and history you can replace the default languages presented in the player's handbook with new ones or split languages up into several different dialects. Some worlds, regional differences might be much more important than racial ones. Perhaps all the dwarves, elves and humans who live in one kingdom speak a common language which is completely different from that spoken in the neighboring kingdom. This might make communication and diplomacy between two kingdoms significantly more difficult. Widely used languages might have ancient versions or there might be completely different ancient tongues that adventurers find written in tombs and ruins. Such languages can add an element of mystery to inscriptions and terms that characters encounter. You might invent additional secret languages besides druidic and thieves can't, that allow members of certain organizations or, or political affiliations to communicate. You could even decide that each alignment has its own language, which might be more of an argot used to primarily discuss philosophical concepts 
Like that sounds horrible. That sounds super unrealistic to have a to have an alignment only language. It's not like the people of a, of a certain alignment know themselves to be of that alignment. And where would they even learn this particular dialect? That's ridiculous. That's very, very unrealistic and not very helpful for your story, I guess. Not very cinematic. I do not approve. I only approve stuff that's uh, cinematic and realistic and very fantasy-like. I approve nothing else. In a region where one race has subjugated another, the language of the conquerors can be a mark of social status. Similarly, reading and writing might be restricted by law to upper classes of society. Factions and organizations. Temples, guilds, orders, secret societies and colleges are important forces in the, so in the social order of any civilization. Their influence might stretch across multiple towns and cities with or without similarly wide-ranging political authority. Organizations can play an important part in the lives of player characters, becoming their patrons, allies or enemies just like individual non-player characters. When characters join these organizations, they become part of something larger than themselves, which can give their adventures a context in the wider world. Adventurers and organizations. At the start of a campaign, backgrounds are a great way to connect adventurers to your world. As the game progresses though, background ties often become less important. Factions and organizations aimed at player characters are a way to keep higher level adventurers connected to your world, providing ties to key NPCs and a clear agenda beyond the individual game. In the same way, villainous organizations create an ongoing sense of menace above and beyond the threat of solitary foes. Having different characters tied to different factions can create interesting situations at the gaming table. As long as these factions have similar goals, don't work in opposition to one another all the time. Adventurers representing different factions might have competing interests or priorities while they pursue the same goals. Adventurer organizations are also a great source of special rewards beyond experience points and treasure. Increased standing in an organization has value in and of itself and might also come with concrete benefits, such as access to an organization's information, equipment, magic, and other resources. Creating factions. Factions and organizations that you create for your campaign should grow out of stories that are important to the world. Create organizations that your players will want to interact with whether as allies, members, or enemies. As a starting point, decide what role you want an organization to play in the world. What is it all about? What are its goals? Who founded it and why? What do its members do? Answering these questions should give you a good sense of organization's personality. From there, think about typical members. How might people describe them? What are the typical members' classes and alignments? What personality traits do they tend to share? Choosing a symbol and a motto for the organization is a way of summing up the work you've done so far. A faction that uses a stag as a symbol probably has a very different personality from the one that uses a winged viper. For a motto, choose not a message but also a tone and style of speech that fits the organization you've defined it. Consider a motto of the Harpers. Down with tyranny, fairness and equality for all. The Harpers have a straightforward message of freedom and prosperity. Contrast that with the motto of a group of politically allied cities in the north, calling themselves Lord's Alliance. Threats to home must be terminated without prejudice. Superiority is our security. These are sophisticated people involved in a delicate political alliance, with more emphasis on stability than on fairness and equality. Finally, think about the ways that player characters might come into contact with these organizations. Who are the important members, not just the leaders, but the agents in the field that the adventurers might encounter? Where are they active, and where do they have headquarters or strongholds? If adventurers do join, what kind of missions might they be sent on? What rewards can they gain? Sample Faction The Harpers the Harpers 
is a scattered network of spellcasters and spies who advocate equality and covertly oppose the abuse of power, magical or otherwise. The organization has risen, been shattered and risen again several times. Its longevity and resilience are largely due to its deconstructed, grassroots, secretive nature and the autonomy of its various members. The Harpers have small cells and lone operatives throughout the Forgotten Realms. Although they interact and share information with one another from time to time as needs warrant, the Harpers' ideology is noble and its members pride themselves on their ingenuity and incorruptibility. Harpers don't seek power or glory, only fair and equal treatment for all. Motto, down with tyranny, fairness and equality for all. Beliefs The Harpers' beliefs can be summarized as follows. One can never have too much information or, arc or arcane knowledge. Too much power leads to corruption, and the abuse of magic in particular must be closely monitored. No one should be powerless. Goals Gather information throughout Faerun. Stern the political dynamics within each region and promote fairness and equality by covert means. Act openly as a last resort. Thwart tyrants and any leader, government or group that grows too powerful. Aid the weak, the poor and the oppressed. Typical quests Typical Harper quests include securing an artifact that would upset the balance of power in a region, gathering information on a powerful individual or organization, and determining the true intentions of an ambitious political figure or evil spellcaster. Okay, this is an organization. Harper's pretty interesting. Or well, pretty okay. Covert organizations in these sort of settings are usually evil, and Harper's are. Basically, the opposite of very goody two shoes. And they're a covert, largely covert organization, which is, I think, a nice idea. But the part where they describe typical quests and they talk about stuff like quests, like, that's too rigid. In real life, you don't get quests. And if you were to live in a. If you were to live in a fantasy setting, in real life, you wouldn't get quests. In a cool movie, you wouldn't get quests. The story just unfolds, and I feel like thinking about it from that angle is bad advice for DMs, really. And yeah, you shouldn't think about these things in terms of quests, in my opinion. It's gonna make you write bad adventures, just saying. Uh, rather, you should just think organically about it. If you have a character that would fit as a part of if you have a character in mind that would fit as a part of a large organization, so just put him in there and maybe uh, add some acquaintances of his from the organization to add color, uh, something interesting to it. Yeah, go for it, but mm, don't make it like a video game where you can join a, a group and grind reputation and do quests for them. I, I'm a strong... Um, advocate for not making tabletop RPG look like video games. Don't do it. Don't do it. Try not to do it. Anyway, Renown. Renown is an optional rule you can use to track an adventurer standing within a particular faction or organization. Another thing I'm probably gonna hate as an idea. Anyway, Renown is a numerical value that starts at zero then increases as character earns favor and reputation within a particular organization. You can tie characters' benefits to a character's renown, including ranks and titles within the organization and access to resources. A player tracks renown separately for each organization his or her character is a member of. For example, an adventurer might have renown 5 within one faction and 20 renown within another. Based on the character's interaction with each organization over the course of the campaign, Gaining Renown character earns renown by completing missions or quests that serve the organization's interests or involve the organization directly. You'll award renown at your discretion as characters complete these missions or quests, typically at the same time as you award experience points. Example 
Examples of faction ranks, Renown Worn, Harpers, Watcher, Order of the Gauntlet, Cheval, Emerald and Clay, Spring Warden, Lord's Alliance, Cloak, Zenter and Fang, Renown Three, Harpers, Harp Shadow, Order of the Gauntlet, Marchion, Emerald Enclave, Summer Strider, Lord's Alliance, Red Knife, Zenterim, Wolf, Renown 10, Harpers, Bright Candle, Order of the Gauntlet, White Hawk, Emerald Enclave, Autumn Reaver, Lord's Alliance, Stingblade, Zenterim, Viper, Renown 25, Harpers, Wise Owl, Order of the Gauntlet, Vindicator, Emerald Enclave, Winter Stalker, Lord's Alliance, War Duke, Zenterim, R Dragon. Renown 50 Harpers by Harper. Order of the Gauntlet, Righteous Hand. Emerald Enclave, Master of the Wild. Lord's Alliance, Lion Crown. Zenterim, Red Lord. Alright, I absolutely hate this so far. This is very video game like. It's. It's just no to me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Harp on it. On how much I hate it too much. My advice for you is for a good game, try to keep it cinematic and as much as a real life adventure would look like in your mind, and as little as a video game would look like in your mind. That's my advice. That's how I like my games. I think this works. And I, I think this works, not just for me. I think it's gonna work for you if you try it too. So. Okay, okay, okay. You award renown at your discretion as characters complete these missions or quests typically at the same time you award experience points. Advancing on organization's interests increases a character's renown within that organization by one. Completing a mission specifically assigned by that organization or which directly benefits the organization increases the character's renown by two instead. For example, characters with connections to the Noble Order of the Gauntlet complete a mission in which they free a town from the tyranny of a blue dragon. Because the Order likes to punish evildoers, you might increase each character's renown within the Order by one. Conversely, if killing the dragon was a mission given to the adventurers by a senior member of the Order, completing the task might instead increase each character's renown by two, showing the adventurers as effective allies. Meanwhile, the party's rogue might have looted a box of rare poisons from the dragon's hoard and sold it to a fence who's secretly a Zenterim agent. You might increase the rogue's renown with the Zentorim by two, since this action directly increased that group's power and wealth, even though the task was not assigned by an agent of the Zentarim. Benefits of Renown the Benefits of increasing renown within an organization can include rank and authority, friendly attitudes from members of the organization, and other perks. Rank Characters can earn promotions as their renown increases, you can establish certain thresholds of renown that serve as pre prerequisites, though not necessarily the only prerequisites for advancing in rank as shown in the examples of faction ranks table. For example, a character might join the Lord's Alliance after earning one renown within that organization. Gaining the title of cloak as the character's renown within the organization increases, he or she might be eligible for further increases in rank. You can add rank prerequisites, for example, a character affiliated with the Lord's Alliance might have to be at least 5th level before becoming a Stingblade, at least 10th level to be a War Duke, and at least 15th level to be a Lion Crown. You can set these thresholds of renown to any numbers that work for your game, creating appropriate ranks and titles for the organizations in your campaign. This is horrendous, by the way. I hate this. Why would you do that? Attitudes of organization members. As characters renowned within the organization grows, members of that organization are increasingly likely to have heard of, of the character. You can set thresholds at which the default attitude of an organization members towards the character becomes indifferent or friendly. For example, members of the Emerald Enclave, a faction dedicated to preserving the natural order, might be less friendly toward characters who have not cultivated at least three renown within that organization. Becoming friendly by default only when a character has gained 10 renown within the Emerald Enclave. These thresholds apply only to default attitude of most members of an organization, and such attitudes aren't automatic. NPC faction members might dislike an adventurer despite the character's renown, or perhaps because of it. Perks Earning a rank within an organization 
outcomes with certain benefits as defined by you. A character of low rank might gain access to reliable contact and adventure leads. A safe house or a trader willing to offer a discount on adventuring gear. A middle rank character might gain a follower. See chapter 4, creating non-player characters. Access to potions and scrolls. The ability to call in a favor or backup on dangerous missions. A high ranking character might be able to call on a small army, take custody of a rare magic item, gain access to a helpful spellcaster, or assign special missions to members of lower rank. Downtime activities. It might allow characters to spend downtime between adventures building relationships and gaining renown within an organization. For more information on downtime activities, see chapter 6 between adventures. Uh, I don't like this chapter very much. This isn't how I like running my games. I mean, obviously, if you like this sort of thing, this sort of tracking stuff and gaming, uh, gaming your reputation within the world, rather than making something immersive and natural and not with a number put to it. If you want it that way, do it that way, but I wouldn't do it that way. Losing renown. Disagreements with members of an organization aren't enough to cause a loss of renown within that organization. However, serious offenses committed against the organization or its members can result in a loss of renown and rank within the organization. The extent of the loss depends on the infraction and is left to your discretion. Character's renown within an organization can never drop below zero. Piety With a few alterations, the renown system can also serve as a measure of characters linked to gods. It's a great option for campaigns where the gods take active roles in the world. Using this approach, you track renown based on specific divine figures in your campaign. Each character has the option to select a patron, deity, or pantheon with goals, doctrine, and taboos that you have created. Any renown he or she earns is called piety. The character gains piety for honoring his or her gods, fulfilling their commands, and respecting their taboos. A character loses piety for working against these gods, dishonoring them, defiling their temples, and foiling their aims. The gods bestow favors on those who prove their devotion. With each rank of piety gained, a character can pray for divine favor once per day. This favor usually comes in the form of a cleric spell like Bless. The favor often comes with a sign of divine benefactor. For example, a character dedicated to Thor might receive a spell accompanied by the Boom of Thunder. A high level of piety can also lead to a character gaining more persistent benefits. In the form of a blessing or charm, see chapter 7, treasure, or such supernatural gifts. Magic in your world. In most, like, no, oh, this is going to be good, this is going to be a better one. I have a feeling. Magic in your world. In most D&D worlds, magic is natural, but still wondrous and sometimes frightening. People everywhere know about magic, and most people see evidence of it at some point in their lives. It permeates the cosmos and moves through the ancient possessions of legendary heroes. The mysterious ruins of fallen empires, those touched by the gods, creatures born with supernatural power, and individuals who study the secrets of the multiverse. Histories and fireside tales are filled with the exploits of those who wield it. What normal folk know of magic depends on where they live and whether they know characters who practice magic. Citizens of an isolated hamlet might not practice magic. Might wait, no. Citizens of an isolated hamlet might not have seen true magic used for generations, and speak in whispers of the strange powers of the old hermit living in the nearby woods. In the city of Waterdeep, in the Forgotten Realm setting, the watchful order of magists and protectors is a guild of wizards. These arcanists wish to make wizardry more accessible so the order's members can profit from selling their services. Some D&D settings have more magic in them than others. On Athos, the harsh world of the Dark Sun setting, arcane magic is a hated practice that can drain life from the world. Much of Athos's magic lies in the hands of evildoers. Conversely, in the world of Eberron, magic is as commonplace as any other commodity. Mercantile houses sell magic items and services to anyone who can afford them. People purchase tickets to ride airships and trains propelled by elemental magic. Consider these questions when fitting magic into your world. Is some magic common? Is some socially unacceptable? Which magic is rare? 
Now, unusual uh, members of each spellcasting class are common are those who can cast high level spells. How rare are magic items, magic locations, and creatures that have supernatural powers? At what power level do these things go from everyday to exotic? How do authorities regulate and use magic? How do normal folks use magic and protect themselves from it? The answers to some questions suggest the answers to others. For example, if spellcasters of low level spells are common, as in Eberron, then authorities and common folk are more likely to have access to and use the results of such spells. Buying commonplace magic isn't only possible, but also less expensive. People are more likely to keep well-known magic in mind and to protect against it, especially in risky situations. Okay, let's read another sample faction. Sample faction, the Zentarim. The Zentarim, also known as the Black Network, is an unscrupulous shadow network that seeks to expand its influence and power throughout the Forgotten Realms. The public face of the Black Network appears relatively benign. It offers the best and cheapest goods and services, both illegal and illicit, thus destroying its competitors and making everyone depend on it. A member of the Zentrum thinks of himself or herself as a member of a very large family and relies on the Black Network for resources and security. However, Members are granted the autonomy to pursue their own interests and gain some measure of personal wealth and influence. As a whole, the Zentrum promises the best of the best. Although, in truth, the organization is more interested in spreading its own propaganda and influence than investing in the improvement of its individual members. Motto Join us and prosper, oppose us and suffer. Beliefs The Zentrum beliefs can be summarized as follows. The Zentarim is your family. You watch out for it, and it watches out for you. You are the master of your own destiny. Never be less than what you deserve to be. Everything and everyone has a price. Gold. Amass wealth, power, and influence, and thereby dominate Faerun. Typical quests. Typical Zentarim quests include plundering or stealing a treasure hoard, powerful magic item or artifact, Securing a lucrative business contract or enforcing a pre-existing one and establishing a foothold in place where the Zentrum holds a little sway. Okay. That's a Zentrum. I think they appear like you can find Zentrum NPCs in Baldur's Gate 1. Can you not? I think you can. Let's get back to magic. Restrictions on magic. Some civilized areas might restrict or prohibit the use of magic. Spellcasting might be forbidden without license or official permission. In such a place, magic, items and continual magical effects are rare, with protections against magic being the exception. Some localities might prohibit specific spells. It could be a crime to cast any spells used to steal or swindle, such as those that bestow invisibility, or produce illusions. Enchantments that charm or dominate others are readily outlawed, since they rob their subjects of free will. Destructive spells are likewise prohibited for obvious reasons. A local ruler could have a phobia about the specific effect of a spell, such as shapeshifting effects if he or she were afraid of being impersonated and enact a law restricting that type of magic. It's actually pretty cool to usually you'd think, oh, the, the restricted one is going to be necromancy. Oh, necromancy restricted for sure, necromancy. Right? But they used very different uh, examples. And these are pretty cool, especially the bit if you were to have a ruler that is uh, afraid of being impersonated or particularly afraid of being charmed. Well, there is even a spell that makes it so that people can, can't lie. I'm not sure which school it is. Zone of Truth, I think, or Detect Truth. And wouldn't it be cool if that were outlawed because because the ruling guy, he fears of his and his people's secrets being divulged. Or feels like that's too much of a thought control thing. That's interesting. It's an interesting take. Much more interesting than just, uh, for example, outlining like necromancy or destructive spells. Schools of magic. The rules of the game refer to the schools of magic, abjuration, illusion, necromancy, and so on. But it's up to you to determine what those schools signify in your world. Similarly, a few class options suggest the existence of magic using organizations in the world, bardic colleges and druid circles, which are up to you 
to flesh out. You could decide that no form of structures like these exist in your world. Wizards and bards and druids might be so rare that the player character learns from a single mentor and never meets another character of the same class. In which case, wizards would learn their school special specialization without any formal training. However, if magic is more common, academies can be the embodiments of the schools of magic. Those institutions have their own hierarchies, traditions, regulations and procedures. For example, Materus the necromancer could be a brother of the necromantic Cabal of Sarzad. As a sign of his high standing within its hierarchy, he is allowed to wear the red and green robes of a master. Of course, when he wears those robes, his occupation is easily identified by those who know of the Cabal. The recognition could be a boon or a nuisance since the Cabal of Tarzad has a fearsome reputation. If you go this route, you can treat schools of magic, bardic colleges and druid circles as organizations using the guidelines for organizations presented earlier in this chapter. A player character, necromancer, might cultivate renown within the couple of Tarzad, while a bard seeks increasing renown within the college of Mark Fuermid. I can't read that. Mark Fuir... Fuir... I... I... Like, that's... That's Celtic. I can't. Sorry. Gaelic. I, I couldn't tell you. College of Mark something. Teleportation circles. The presence of a permanent teleportation circle in major cities helps cement their important place in the economy of a fantasy world. Spells such as plane shift, teleport and teleportation circle connect with these circles which are found in temples, academies, the headquarters of arcane organizations and prominent civic locations. However, since every teleportation circle is a possible means of entry into a city, they're guarded by military and magical protection. As you design a fantasy city, think about the teleportation circles it might contain and which ones adventurers are likely to know about. If the adventurers commonly return to their home base by means of a teleportation circle, use that circle as a hook for plot developments in your campaign. What do the adventurers do if they arrive in the teleportation circle and find all the familiar wards are disabled and guards lying in pools of blood? What if their arrival interrupts an argument between two feuding priests at the temple? Adventure and Zeus. It's a good hook. Bringing back the dead. When a creature dies, its soul departs its body, leaves the material planes, travels through the astral plane and goes to abide on the plane where the creature's deity resides. If the creature didn't worship a deity, its soul departs the plane corresponding to its alignment. Bring someone back from the dead means retrieving the soul from that plane and returning it to its body. Enemies can take steps to make it more difficult for a character to be returned from the dead. Keeping the body prevents others from using raised dead or resurrection to restore the slain character to life. A soul can't be returned to life if it doesn't wish to be. A soul knows the name, alignment and patron deity if any of the character attempting to revive it and might refuse to return on that basis. For example, if the Honourable Knight Sturm Brightblade is slain and the High Priestess of Akhesis, God of Evil Dragons, grabs his body, Sturm might not wish to be raised by her. Or Sturm. I'm not sure how to read that name. Any attempts she makes to revive him automatically fail. If the evil cleric wants to revive Sturm to interrogate him, she needs to find some way to trick his soul, such as duping a good cleric into raising him and then capturing him once he is alive again. That's actually a clever thing. I didn't know that if you're being resurrected in D&D &D, you get to know the alignment and patron deity of the person trying to resurrect you. I think that um, the death of a character should have gravity to it. It should be something that doesn't happen lightly. And it shouldn't be like Superhero comics where people get killed, they come back, they get killed again, they come back again, and so on and so forth. Because then death as the theme in your story becomes a joke, essentially. It can't, it, that can't be a theme in your story, and you still have a lot of it. So what's the point? But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for removing resurrection spells from, from your D&D campaign altogether, because... Oh, you're playing D and D. You've chosen this setting because clearly you want the D and D stuff, the high-powered spells. For God's sake, you have wish at level nine. 
the characters are meant to do broken things. So just like try to figure it out nicely, maybe make it so that there are costs of death or, or make it so that players might at times not want to come back. Anyway, creating a campaign. The world you create is a state for the adventures you set in it. You don't have to give more thought to it than that. You can run adventures in an episodic format. The characters is the only common element and also weave themes throughout these adventures to build the greater saga of the characters' achievements in the world. Planning an entire campaign might seem like a daunting task, but you don't have to plot out every detail right from the start. You can start with the basics, running a few adventures and think about larger plot lines you want to explore as campaign progresses. You're free to add as much or as little detail as you wish. The start of a campaign resembles the start of an adventure. You want to jump quickly into the action. Show the players that adventure awaits and grab their attentions right away. Give the players enough information to make them want to come back week after week to see how the story plays out. Like, here's my take on how to make a campaign. Make a single single game scenario. Like, make what you plan for the, the players to, to make a single game scenario. And then let the players play it and it's gonna take them 10 games and it's basically gonna be like a campaign. That's my advice. Because my players, they always create deters and problems and these sort of things. And what's supposed to be a single game takes 10 games and voila, you have a campaign. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a joke, but not really. It happens. Start of a campaign, blah, blah, blah. Start small. When you first start building your campaign, start small. Characters need to know only about the city, town or village where they start the game and perhaps the nearby dungeon. You might decide that the barony is at war with a nearby duchy or that the distant forest is crawling with etta caps and giant spiders and you should note these things. But at the start of the game, the local area is enough to get the campaign off the ground. Follow these steps to create that local area. Step 1. Create a home base. See the settlement sections earlier in this chapter for guidance on building this settlement. A small town or a village at the edge of the wilderness serves as a fine home base in most D&D campaigns. Use a larger town or city if you want to campaign with urban adventuring. Create a local region. See mapping the campaign earlier in this chapter for guidance. Draw a map at province scale. One hex equals one mile with the home base near the center. Fill in an area within a day's travel about 20 to 30 miles of the home base. Pepper it with two to four dungeons or similar adventure locales. An area that size is likely to have one to three additional settlements as well as the home base, so give thought to them as well. Craft a starting adventure. A single dungeon makes a good first adventure for most campaigns. See Chapter 3 Creating Adventures for Guidance. A home base provides a common starting location for the, char for the characters. This starting point might be the village where they grew up or a city that attracted them from points beyond. Or perhaps they begin the campaign in the dungeons of an evil baron's castle where they've been locked up for various reasons, legit legitimate or otherwise, throwing them into the midst of the adventure. Another th good advice for creating a campaign is squeeze your players when they're making their characters to come up with a goal for the character. Like, my character has an enemy, for example, and it doesn't have to be very specific. It could be like, you know, that he's, a, he's for example, a, a mad wizard or whatever, and he locked me up and he did this and that, and now I want to look for him. Or I'm looking for the six-fingered man who killed my father. You have four player characters, or three, but three at the very least, right? And every single one of them is going to provide you with, an, with a sub-story, with an enemy, with an agenda of some sort, right? And that's going to give you so much for your campaign. You just need to build the, build the people around it, uh, some contacts, maybe some locales, dangerous ones where the players might want to go. They don't have to be dungeons strictly. But I'm not a fan of dungeons strictly, where you walk in, you kill stuff, you loot stuff, and you go out. You get the idea. Something where, some place where in a movie characters might go to retrieve something and have a, have a great adventure. Use your players basically to come up with material for your campaigns. Set the stage. As you start to develop your campaign, you will need to fill in the players on the basics. For easy distribution, compile essential information into a campaign handout. Such a handout typically includes the following material. 
any restrictions or new options for a character creation, such as new or prohibited races, and information in the backstory of your campaign that the characters would know about. If you have a theme or direction in mind for the campaign, this information could include seeds hinting at that focus. Basic information about the area where the characters are starting, such as the name of the town, important locations in it and around it, prominent NPCs they'd know about, and perhaps rumors that point the trouble that's brewing. Keep this handout short and to the point. Two pages is a reasonable maximum. Even if you have a burst of creative energy that produces 20 pages of great background material, save it for your adventures, let the players uncover the details gradually in play. Involving the characters. Once you've identified what your campaign is about, let the players help tell the story by deciding how their characters are involved. Ooh, ooh, that's the advice I, I've given you. Like the, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna say the same thing, I bet. This is the, their opportunity to tie their character's history and background to the campaign, and a chance for you to determine how the various elements of each character's background tie into the campaign's story. For example, what secret has the hermit character learned? What is the status of the noble character's family? What is the folk hero's destiny? Some players might have trouble coming up with ideas. Not everyone is equally inventive. You can help spur their creativity with a few questions about their characters. Are you a native born and raised in the area? If so, who's your family? What's your current occupation? Are you a recent arrival? Where did you come from? Why did you come to this area? Are you tied to any of the organizations or people involved in the events that kick off the campaign? Are there friends or enemies? Listen to the player's ideas and say yes if you can. Even if you want all the characters to have grown up in the starting town, consider allowing a recent arrival or a transplant if the player's story is convincing enough. Suggest alterations to a character's story so it better fits your world or weave the first threads of your campaign into that story. I haven't done this in my previous campaigns, but I've recently come to appreciate characters that are made with a, with a game in mind. Characters that are basically thought of in a way that lets them be an active part of the group. Keep the group together as a party, as a group. They don't have to strictly be good to everyone around them or be well liked or people don't have to like each other in the party. but. It really adds so much to the campaign if the players play characters that want to be involved with the story and the other characters. You don't have trouble as the GM when people, when people's characters, they, they hate each other, they don't care for each other, they don't care for the adventure, they don't care for anything, perhaps. That makes it so hard to make we, the plot cogwheels spin. So try to encourage, I think, like, I didn't do it in the past, but if I were to run a campaign now, I'd try to encourage my players to make characters that are going to create an interest, that are going to create a dynamic between each other and go on with the, what's going in the game. Not passive characters and not characters that want to have nothing to do with each other. Mind you, they might hate each other, but they should have a reason to be in it and to be in it together. You don't want to split the party completely and have everyone do their own thing and everything takes four times as long and nobody's having as much fun as they could be. That's my two cents. Yeah. And it's not like, like that's not strictly related to what they're talking about because this is about setting the stage but I thought about because they mentioned character creation. Creating a background. Backgrounds are designed to root player characters in the world and creating new backgrounds is, great, is a great way to introduce players to the special features of your world. Backgrounds that have ties to particular cultures, organizations and historical events from your campaign are particularly strong. Perhaps the priests of a certain religion live as beggars supported by a pious populace. Singing the tales of their deities' exploits to entertain and enlighten the faithful. You could create a mendicant priest background or modify the acolyte background to reflect these qualities. It could include musical instrument proficiency, and its feature probably involves receiving hospitality from the faithful. Guidelines for creating a new background are provided in Chapter 9, Dungeon Master's Workshop. Campaign Events This is probably the most important thing. The story, in my opinion, is always more important in the world. The world should facilitate the happening of the story. It could give you some ideas for the story of every pre-made world, but the story comes first. Campaign events. Significant events in the history of a fantasy world tend toward immense upheavals 
wars, the pit forces of good against evil, an epic confrontation, natural disasters that lay waste to entire civilizations, invasions of vast armies or extraplanar hordes, assassinations of world leaders, these world-shaking events tie the chapters of history. In a D&D &D game, such events provide the sparks that can ignite and sustain a campaign. The most common pitfall of serial stories without the set beginning, middle, and end is inertia. Like many television shows and comic book series, the D&D &D campaign runs the risk of retreading the same ground long after the enjoyment has gone. Just as actors or writers drift away from these other mediums, token players, the actors and writers of a D&D &D game, games stagnate when the story meanders too long without a change in tone. When the same villains and similar adventures grow tiresome and predictable, and when the world doesn't change around the characters, world-shaking events force conflict, they set new events and power groups in motion. Their outcomes change the world by altering the tone of the setting in a meaningful way. They chronicle the story of your world in a big bold print. Change, especially change that occurs as a result of the character's actions, keeps the story moving. If change is imperceptible, the actions of the characters lack significance. When the world becomes reliable, it's time to shake things up. Alright, I was going. When they started with these world shaking events, extra planar hordes, that sort of thing, I thought they would kind of swerve the other direction and advise the GM to maybe come up with something small scale in like for for your characters, a way of life for your for your guys and start the personal adventure. A personal adventure for the characters. Come, I really like personal stories too. Stuff that doesn't involve all the aforementioned epic scale stuff. For example, a personal vendetta like Inigo Montoya from, from The Princess Bride. There are no earth-changing, world-changing events in his story. But it's very compelling. It's a personal story. It's a story of personal vengeance. And I really like these sort of stories. I love Inigo Montoya from... Princess Bride, he's my favorite character in the movie and in the book and I really like the the movie too. It's one of my favorite movies. My absolutely favorite movies. It's probably top three. Maybe Dungeons and Dragons probably lends itself a little better to these epic scale conflicts because characters and their magic become so powerful so quickly. But you should try it, like at least at the lower levels, you should try for some personal Sorry, you might like it. I like. I tend to like it more, and your players might like it too. Just saying. I have nothing against epic fantasy. Every now and then, putting events in motion, world-shaking events can happen at any time in a campaign or story arc. But the biggest incidents naturally fall at the beginning, middle, and end of a story. That placement reflects the structure of dramatic stories. At the beginning of a story, something happens to shake the protagonist's world and spur them into action. The characters take action to resolve their problems, but other forces oppose them. As they reach a significant milestone towards their goal, a major conflict disrupts the characters' plans, shaking their world again. Failure seems imminent. At the end of the story, they succeed or fail, and the world is shaken again by the way the characters change it for good or ill. At the beginning of a D&D campaign, world-shaking events create instant adventure hooks and affect the characters' lives directly. In the middle, they make great turning points as the characters' fortunes reverse, rising after a defeat or falling after a victory. Near the end of a campaign, such events serve as excellent climactic episodes with far-reaching effects. They might even occur after the story has ended as a result of the characters' actions. When not to shake it up. In constructing a narrative, beware of false action or action for its own sake. False actions don't move a story forward, engage characters, or cause them to change. Many action movies suffer from false action in which car chases, gunfights, and explosions abound but do little more than inconvenience the characters and eventually bore the audience with the repetition and dearth of meaningful stakes. Some D&D campaigns fall into the same trap, stringing world-spanning disasters together one after another with little impact on the characters or the world, thus probably not in the DM's best interest to reorder the world every single time there's a lull in the action. Thus, world-shaking events became ordinary. As a general rule, a campaign can sustain up to three large-scale world-shaking events, one near the beginning, one near the middle, and one near the end. 
uses many small-scale events that disturb the bounded microcosms of towns, villages, tribes, fiefs, duchies, provinces, and so forth, as you like. Every significant event shakes someone's world. After all, no matter how small that might be, let unexpected and terrible events regularly afflict the world's smaller, smaller territories, but unless your story demands it. Save large-scale map spanning events for the biggest, most important moments of your campaign. Oh, 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 I'm gonna sell you a great storytelling trick. There's probably many people who used it, but I came up with it myself independently, and there's probably many people who came up with it themselves independently. It could even be somewhere in the theory of, of storytelling. What I like to do is when you have a story development in mind, for example, we want at some point in time, you want a, a bleeding NPC stumble into the player's room in, in a in a tavern because they they got the wrong room for example and that's meant to be a, a plot hook right that's that's going to be the start of a of a new sub story within your campaign for example you you've decided on that right and they have something to say it's, this leads to something that you want to introduce right but you you haven't decided where to put it do not put it in a random spot do not put it when players expect it preferably set up the expectations of the players for something else to happen for example they have they have been, say, the previous task was they have been commissioned to retrieve a magical stone. And they're carrying the stone, and they've used all their spells, they've used all their abilities, they're drained off of everything, they're very tired. And pacing-wise, what would fit into it is that they come back to their base or to the person that hired them, and they expect to just hand in the reward, that the next plot development is going to be handing in the reward. You should put in your big revelation where they expect a hand in, a dialogue, something else, shopping, or even put it right in the middle of a different quote-unquote mission. Choose the place where they absolutely least expect it and where it, where it fits absolutely least, right? Because this is going to create trouble. They're going to think what to do next. Pick the worst place where it could happen. Always pick the worst place where it could happen. Right? When I think about it, it's like the it's like a uh, like a reverse DSX machina. DSX machina is basically a device where by divine providence something appears to solve the problems of the characters. To resolve a plot point, it's just smacked in to, to solve a problem. And it doesn't even have to make sense. Why I describe this as an anti-DSX machina, because it does come out of the blue. DSX Machina also comes out of the blue. It's like there is no setup to it. There's nothing to it. And this appears out of nowhere to create a problem. As a storyteller, so long as it's not the very end of the story, you want to create problems, not solve them. So yeah, put your things in where they're gonna make the most problems. That's my, that's my little tidbit. It really worked so well historically for me. So that's why I recommend it. Well, it doesn't have to be a world-shaking event. It doesn't have to be like a, a planner invasion. It could be anything. World-shaking events. You can use this section or ideas or an inspiration to expand on world-shaking events already occurring or soon to occur within your world. Alternatively, you can roll on the tables below to randomly generate an event to inspire your imagination. The attempt to justify a random result can reveal unforeseen possibilities. To get started, select the world-shaking event category or roll on a world shaking events table. I wouldn't have believed there is a world shaking events table in a D&D &D handbook. In a modern D&D &D handbook, because it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but apparently it is. If you want to leave these sort of things to a roll of a D10, that's the book for you. Roll D10. Rise of a leader or an era. Fall of a leader or an era. Cataclysmic disaster. Assault or invasion, rebellion, revolution, overthrow, extinction or depletion, new organization, discovery, expansion, invention, prediction, omen, prophecy, myth, and legend. So these are the ones. Okay, rise or fall of a leader or an era. Eras are often defined by the prominent leaders, innovators, and tyrants of the day. These people changed the world and etched their signatures indelibly on the pages of history. When they rise to power, they shape the time and place where they live in monumental ways. When they fall from power or pass away, the ghost of their presence lingers, determining the kind of leader that influences the new or passing era. You can choose the type of leader or determine one randomly using the leader types table. They have tables for a lot of things. 
leader types d6 1 political 2 religious 3 military 4 crime underworld 5 art culture 6 philosophy learning magic political leaders are monarchs nobles and chiefs religious leaders include deities avatars high priests and messiahs as well as these in charge of monasteries and leaders of influential religious sects. Major military leaders control the armed forces of countries. They include military dictators, warlords and heads of a ruler's war council. Minor military leaders include the heads of local militias, gangs and other martial organizations. Of the broadest scale, a criminal or underworld leader wields power through a network of spies, bribes and black market trade. On the smallest scale, these are local gang bosses, pirate captains and brigands. A leader in art or culture is a virtuoso whose work reflects the spirit of the age and changes the way people think. A prominent playwright, bard or court fool in whose words, art or performance the people perceive universal truth. On a smaller scale, this might be an influential local poet, minstrel, satirist or sculptor. A major leader in philosophy, learning or magic is a genius philosopher a counselor to emperors and enlightened thinker, the head of the highest institution of learning in the world, or an archmage. A minor leader might be a local sage, seer, hedge wizard, wise elder, or teacher. Rise of a leader, beginning of an era. In dramatic stories, a new leader's rise often comes at the end of a period of struggle or turmoil. Sometimes it's a war or uprising, other times it's an election, the death of a tyrant, a prophecy fulfilled or the appointment of a hero. Conversely, a new leader might be a tyrant, a fiend or a black-hearted villain and the era that just ended could have been one of peace, tranquility and justice. A new leader shakes the foundations of your campaign world and begins a new era in the selected region. How does this era begin to affect the world? Here are several things to consider when determining the leader's impact on the world. Name one thing that has been consistently true about the world which is now no longer true due to this leader's change or influence. This is the biggest change that occurs when a new leader takes power and becomes the prevailing trait that defines the era, the characteristic for which it is remembered. Name the person or people whose death, defeat or loss opened the door for this leader to take power. This might be a military defeat, the overthrow of old ideas, a cultural rebirth or something else. Who died, lost or was defeated? What weren't they willing to compromise? Was the new leaders complicit in the death, defeat or loss or was the opportunity serendipitous? Despite the leaders' virtues, one flaw in particular outrages a certain segment of the populace. What is this flaw? What personal group of persons will do their utmost for this leader because of it? Conversely, what is this leader's greatest virtue? and who rises to the leader's defense because of it. Who believes in the leader now, but still retains doubts? This is someone close to the leader, who has the leader's trust and knows his or her secret fears, doubts or vices. It just came to me that it could be a good starting point for a campaign where you have a bunch of characters that are locked in a dungeon. A dungeon dungeon, the kind where you keep prisoners, right? And they're all sentenced for life. And they don't know each other all that well, maybe. But they've sat there for god knows how long together and maybe they came to know each other a little bit but they weren't an adventuring party obviously or they just shared a cell right and this sort of happening the rise of a leader you could make it so that the beginning of the campaign is an amnesty because new leader there's usually amnesties in these sort of situations and they come out of prison together magically they know each other it's a good start it's a decent start at least can't come up with something with some blah, with something a more interesting and you could go for that sort of thing and that's a real life thing too amnesties after a leader changes i like real life things in my campaigns fall of a leader end of an era all that begins must end with the fall of kings and queens the maps of the world are redrawn laws change new customs become all the rage and old ones fall out of favor the attitude of the citizens towards their fallen leader shifts subtly at first and then changes dramatically as they look back or reminisce about the time before the foreign leader might have been a benevolent ruler an influential citizen or even an adversary to the characters how does the death of this person affect those formerly under his or her influence here are several things to consider when determining the effects of a leader's passing Name one positive change that the leader brought to his or her domain or sphere of influence. 
The sad change persists after the leader's death. State the general mood or attitude of the people under this person's power. What important fact didn't they realize about this person or his or her reign, which will later come to light? Name one person or group that tries to fill the leader's shoes in the resulting power vacuum. Name one person or group that plotted against this leader. Name three things for which this leader will be remembered. Uh, okay, number three, cataclysmic disaster. Earthquake, famine, fire, plague, flood, disasters on a grand scale can eradicate whole civilizations without warning. Natural or magical catastrophes redraw maps, destroy economies and alter worlds. Sometimes the survivors would build from the ruins. The Great Chicago Fire, for instance, provided an opportunity to rebuild the city according to a modern plan. Most of the time the disaster leaves only ruins, buried under arch like Pompeii or sunk beneath the waves like Atlantis. You can choose the cataclysm or determine one randomly using the cataclysmic disaster table. Cataclysmic disasters D10 1. Earthquake 2. Famine Drought 3. Fire Flood 5. Plague Disease 6. Rain or Fire Meteoric Impact 7. Storm Hurricane, Tornado, Tsunami 8. Volcanic Eruption 9. Magic Gone Awry or a Planet Warp 10. Divine Judgment. Is this how they came up with Spell Plague? They just rolled a 9. Anyway, some of the disasters on the table might not make immediate sense in the context of your campaign world. A flood in the desert? A volcanic eruption on grassy plains? If you randomly determine a disaster that conflicts with your setting, you can reroll, but the challenge of justifying the catastrophe can produce interesting results. With two exceptions, the disasters on the table resemble those that affect our own world. Think of planar warps and magic gone awry like nuclear incidents. They're big events that unnaturally alter the land and its people. For example, in the Eberron campaign setting, a magical catastrophe lays waste an entire country, transforming it into hostile wasteland and ending the last war. Divine judgment is something else entirely. This disaster takes whatever form you want, but it's always a big, bold, unsubtle sign of a deity's displeasure. You might decide to wipe a town, region or nation off of the map. A disaster ravages the land and effectively eliminates a place the characters once knew. Leave one or two survivors to tell the characters what happened and ensure that the characters feel the depth of the catastrophe. What are the ongoing effects of this cataclysm? Following points can help you define the nature and consequences of the disaster. Decide what caused this cataclysm and where it originated. An omen presaged this event, or a series of signs and omens. Describe the omen in detail. Describe or name the creature that warned the populace about the oncoming disaster. Who listened? Who were the lucky or unlucky ones who survived? Describe what the area looks like after the disaster, in contrast to how it looked before. Assault or invasion. One of the most common world-shaking events, an invasion occurs when one group forcibly takes over another, usually by military strength, but also by infiltration and occupation. An assault differs from an invasion in that the attacking force isn't necessarily interested in occupation or, or taking power. On the other hand, an assault might be the first step of an invasion. Regardless of the scale, a world-shaking event or invasion stands out because its repercussions change the character's world and its effects echo long after the initial attack or takeover. Imagine the part of your campaign world is attacked or invaded. Depending on the current scale of campaign, the area might be as small as a section of a city or as large as a continent, world or plane of existence. Define the aggressor and whether it represents a known enemy or previously unknown adversary. Select a threat that already poses a danger to the area you've chosen or use the invading forces table to determine the aggressor. Okay. About the TNT book, is this a beginner book in storytelling? Well, not really. So far as I've read it, the the TNT rule book, it's not really about. It doesn't give good storytelling hints so far. So far, it's been how to make it into a campaign. They've discussed how to make a map for your world, which you don't really need for storytelling, just for storytelling. They've discussed how to handle organizations, and I feel like for storytelling. Plot points are, are the most important part. You start with good plot points. 
you might want to imagine a scene that you consider epic, that you consider a great moment to your story and build everything to make this scene more powerful and more interesting. And that sort of approach is what I'd recommend for storytelling. You shouldn't start with world building. And this is more for if you want to play D&D. I think it's this, this stuff is going to help you more with world building and running a game than actually with storytelling. I wouldn't treat it as a, as a beginner book in storytelling. I mean, actually, to tell stories, you don't really need a book to tell you how. You should start with, with telling it however you see fit, and you're going to tell one story poorly, and then the next one better, and the next one even better. The secret to it is just don't cringe too hard on your stories early on, and you're going to be fine. Invading Forces, D8, Invading Force, 1, a criminal enterprise, 2, monsters or a unique monster, 3, a planner threat, 4, a past adversary reawakened, reborn, or resurgent, 5, a splinter faction, 6, a savage tribe, 7, a secret society, 8, a traitorous ally, a traitorous ally, such a classic now consider these other aspects of the conflict. Name one element of the invasion or assault that the defenders didn't expect or couldn't repel. Something happened to the first defenders who stood against the invasion or assault. Something no one wants to talk about. What was it? The attackers or invaders had a motive for their action. It wasn't obvious or understood at first. What was it? Who turned traitor and at what point did they turn? Why did they do it? Did an attacker try to stop the incursion, or did the prominent defender throw in with the invaders? 5. Rebellion, Revolution, Overthrow Dissatisfied with the current order, a person or group of people overturns the dominant regime and takes over or fails to take over. Regardless of the result, a revolution, even an attempted one, can shape the destiny of nations. The scale of a revolution need not involve the common masses against the nobility. A revolution can be as small as the merchant's guild revolting against its leadership, or a temple overthrowing its priesthood in favour of a new creed. The spirits of the forest might attempt to overthrow the forces of civilization in a nearby city that cut down trees for timber. Alternatively, the scale can be as dramatic as humanity rising to overthrow the gods. Imagine that part of your campaign world erupts in revolution. Pick a power group in your current campaign and name or invent a group that poses it, fomenting revolution. Then let the following points help you flesh out the conflict. Okay, imagine that part of your campaign world erupts in revolution. Pick a power group in current campaign and name or invent a group that poses it, fomenting revolution. Then let the following points help you flesh out the conflict. Name three things that rebels want or hope to achieve. The rebels achieve a victory against those they wish to overthrow, even if it's a pyrrhic victory. Which of their goals do they achieve? How long is this achievement likely to last? Take the cost exacted upon the old order after its fall from power. Does anyone from the former power group remain in power during the next regime? If that old order remains in power, describe one way that its leaders punish revolutionaries. One of the rebellion's prominent leaders, in some respects, the face of the revolution was driven by a personal reason for his or her part in events. Describe this person and state the true reason he or she led the rebellion. What problem existed before the revolution that persists in spite of it? Okay, I was gonna go on a tangent about the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But I, I mean, that's still real political for the stream. I, I meant to talk about something that could be used for a campaign. But it's a good idea to take bits from real life revolutions or real life political happenings and maybe remake it with different groups, different names, different people for your campaigns. That much I'm gonna say is probably a good idea. Even the language you speak is political. Well, the language you speak is most definitely political political because the language is have like we have allegiance to to a region, I guess. But not that everything is political, come on. I don't like politics very much. Even as a theme for fiction, I don't like politics. I like adventure much more. The light hearted bits. Even if it's a dark adventure, I I, I take that over politics. Anyway, extinction or depletion, something that once existed in the campaign world is gone, fossil fuels. The lost resource might be a precious metal, a species of plant or animal that held an important place in the local ecology or an entire race or culture of people. Its absence causes a chain reaction that affects every creature that uses or relies on it. 
You can eliminate a people, place or thing that previously existed in a certain location or area in your campaign world. On the small scale, the last of a family dynasty passes away, or a once thriving mining community in the region dries up and becomes a ghost town. On a grand scale, magic dies, the last dragon is slain, or the final fey noble departs the world. What is gone from the world, or the region of the world you've chosen that once existed there? If the answer isn't immediately evident, consult the extinction or depletion table for ideas. Extinction or depletion. D8. Lost resource. 1. A kind of animal. Insect, bird, fish, livestock. 2. Habitable land. 3. Magic or magic users. All magic or specific kinds of schools of magic. 4. A mineral resource. Gems, metals, ores. 5. A type of monster. Unicorn, manticore, dragon. 6. A people. Family, line, clan, culture, race. 7. A kind of plant. Crop, tree, herb, forest. 8. A waterway. River, lake, ocean. Oh my god. An entire river, that would be. Actually, I've been thinking, wouldn't it be more interesting to live during the depletion happening? For example, in Lord of the Rings, we can see the last elves departing from the world. And they're not gone completely, but it's this idea of a world in decline. I think the, the Middle-earth, as shown in the Lord of the Rings especially, is a world in decline. And it has a certain quality to it. It adds to the book, it creates a certain atmosphere to it. I'm not like a super huge fan of the Lord of the Rings movies. I like them. I like them a lot, but I'm not like a super huge fan. But I think that the movies convey that part well. Especially, I think the beginning sequence, I'm not sure if it was the first movie or the second one. But one of them starts with Galadriel talking about the world and how she can feel change in the wind, in the earth, and in, in everything. It kind of does convey this climate of the of the books and i really like that part lord of the rings already has like 12 endings to it right it has this big breaking moment when the spoilers spoilers the ring is finally destroyed and after that we know things are gonna be all right that's the critical part that's the that's not the ending of the book but like that's the solution of the one major plot point of the book and after that it's all endings and then then there's the ending where Aragorn talks to them as the king and there's this big party and then there's uh, Frodo departing I'm actually glad that they removed the part where they come back to Shire and save the, the child without the help of the others because we have 12 endings to this movie if we had the Shire part it would be 13 endings to it pacing would be horrible I'm actually for pacing reasons I'm glad they removed that bit well, resolution of the main plot just makes all the end stuff make sense. It does, because it has to happen before, before the end stuff happens. But, at the same time, it's like the point of the most tension in the book. Everything builds up to that. And after it, it just goes slowly down. Everything dies down. So I don't think a movie or a story should last very long after its key plots are resolved. I don't think a movie or a book or anything should take long to finish. From that point, you shouldn't put too much time on it because it's gonna get boring. It's gonna take away from the feeling of epicness. You should leave the stage when tension is still up. We're still in the heat of the moment. That's, that's just my opinion on storytelling. The Hobbit book I really like because it's much more to the point than Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings has a bunch of descriptions. It's much more world building than story. In a way it's a long book where not that much happens. And uh, The Hobbit is a short book where something happens constantly. It's another hot take but I, as a book I like Hobbit more. It's, I think it's a, like, I, I like it more and I think it's a better book. I really wish Tolkien had the opportunity to write the story of Turin Turambar, I think it was. The guy with the cursed sword who killed Laurung and marries his own sister and is generally the edgy hero of Middle-earth. That one. I think it's the best one from the Silmarillion. I wish he, he could have written a book from that one. It would have been really good. Okay then. Okay, 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 okay. Extinction or depletion? Now, we've rolled on the table, let's imagine we rolled on the table, then consider these additional questions. Name a territory, race, or type of creature that relied on the thing that was lost. How did they compensate, or what was lost? 
Who or what is to blame for the loss? Describe an immediate consequence of the loss. Forecast one way that the loss impacts or changes the world in the long term. Who or what suffers the most as a result of the loss? Who or what benefits the most from it? New organization. The foundation of a new order, kingdom, religion, society, cabal or cult can shake the world with its actions, doctrine, dogma and policies. On a local scale, a new organization contends with existing power groups, influencing, subverting, dominating or allying with them to create stronger base of power. Large and powerful organizations can exert enough influence to rule the world. Some new organizations benefit the populace while others grow to threaten the civilization they once protected. Perhaps an important new organization arises in one part of the world. It could have humble or auspicious beginnings, but one thing is certain, it is destined to change the world as long as it progresses along its present course. Sometimes an organization's alignment is apparent from inception, but its morality can remain ambiguous until its doctrines, policies and traditions are reversed over time. Choose the type of organization or use new organizations table to generate ideas. D10. Number 1. Crime Syndicate, Bandit Confederacy 2. Guild, Masons, Apothecaries, Goldsmiths 3. Magical Circle Society 4. Military, Knightly Order 5. New Family, Dynasty, Tribe, Clan 6. Philosophy, Discipline, Dedicated to Principle or Ideal 7. Realm, Village, Town, Duchy, Kingdom 8. Religion, Sect, Denomination 9. School, University 10. Secret Society, Cult, Cabal Then consider some of or all of the following options. The new order supplants a current power group in the world gaining territory, converts or defectors and reducing the previous power group's members. Numbers, sorry. Who or what does the foundation of this new order supplant? The new order appeals to a specific audience. Decide whether this order attracts a certain race, social class or character class. The leader of this new order is known, known for a particular quality valued by his or her followers. Elaborate on why they respect him or her for his quality and what actions their leader has taken to retain the followers support The rival group opposes the foundation of this new organization Choose an existing power group for your campaign to oppose the new organization or create one from the categories on the table Decide why they oppose the new group or who leads them and what they plan to do to stop their rival Discovery expansion invention Discoveries of new lands expand the map and change the boundaries of empires. Discoveries of new magical technology expand the boundaries of what was once thought possible. New resources or archaeological finds create opportunity on wealth and set prospectors and power groups and nations to vie for their control. A new discovery or rediscovery can impact your campaign world in a meaningful way, shaping the course of history and events of the age. Think of this discovery as a big adventure hook or series of hooks. This is also an opportunity to create a unique monster, item, god, plane or race for your world. As long as the discovery matters, it doesn't have to be wholly original, just flavoured for your campaign. The discovery is particularly impressive when the adventurer in your campaign when the adventurers in your campaign are the ones who make it. If they discover a new mineral with magical properties, map a new land that's eminently suitable for colonization or uncover an ancient weapon with the power to wreak devastation on your world they are likely to set major events in motion this gives the players the opportunity to see exactly how much influence their actions have on your world decide on the type of discovery that is made or use the discoveries table to generate ideas d10 discovery 1 ancient ruin lost city of legendary race 2 Animal, monster, magical mutation. 3. Invention, technology, magic. Helpful or destructive. 4. New or forgotten god or planner entity. 5. New or rediscovered artifact or a religious relic. 6. New land, island, continent, lost world, demi play. 7. Otherworldly object, planner, portal, alien spacecraft. 8. People. Race, tribe, lost civilization, colony. 9. Plant, miracle, herb, fungal parasite, sentient plant. 10. Resource or wealth, gold, gems, mithril. Why did they have to go with a parasite for fungus specifically? Like it's a herb or sentient plant. No, the 
It has to be a fungal parasite. That's creepy. Anyway, anyway, once you have determined the type of discovery, flesh it out by deciding exactly what it is, who discovered it, and what potential effect it could have on the world. Ideally, previous adventures in your campaign will help you fill in the blanks. Also keep the following in mind. This discovery benefits a particular person, group, or faction more than others. Who benefits most? Name three benefits they stand to gain from this discovery. This discovery directly harms another person, group, or faction who is harmed the most. Probably the person who got discovered, or the race, or the thing. That's usually how that goes. This discovery has consequences. Name three repercussions or side effects. Who ignores the repercussions? Name two or three individuals or factions struggling to possess or control this discovery. Who is likely to win? What do they start to gain and what are they willing to do to control the discovery? 9. Prediction, Omen, Prophecy, another classic. Sometimes the foretelling of a world-shaking event becomes a world-shaking event, an omen that predicts the fall of empires, the doom of races and the end of the world. Sometimes an omen points to change for the good, such as the arrival of a legendary hero or saviour. But the most dramatic prophecies warn of future tragedies and predict dark ages. And like other world-shaking events, the outcome doesn't happen immediately. Instead, individuals or factions strive to fulfill or revert the prophecy or shape the exact way it will be fulfilled, according to how it will affect them. The prophecies help us or hinder us create adventure hooks in the campaign by actions they take. A prophecy should foretell a big event on a grand scale so that it will take time to come true or be averted. Imagine that a world-shaking prophecy comes to light if events continue on their present course. The prophecy will come true and the world will change dramatically as a result. Don't shy away from making this prophecy both significant and alarming, keeping in mind the following points. Create a prophecy that foretells a major change to the campaign world. You can build one from scratch using ideas from the current campaign or randomly determine a world-shaking event and flesh out the details. Write a list of three or more omens that will occur before the prophecy comes to pass. You can use events that have already occurred in the campaign, but the prophecy is closer to being fulfilled. The rest of are events that might or might not happen, depending on the actions of the characters. Describe the person or creature that discovered the prophecy and how it was found. What did this creature gain by revealing it? What did this person lose or sacrifice? Describe the individual or faction that supports the prophecy and works to ensure its fulfillment, and the one that will do all in its power to avert the prophecy. What is the first step each takes? Who suffers for the efforts? One part of the prophecy is wrong. Choose one of the omens you listed, or one of the details you create for the world-shaking event that the omen predicts. The chosen omen is false and, if applicable, its opposite is true instead. Okay, so I like the bit where they mentioned that it could be a, a prophecy prophesizing something good. That's rather rare. Usually, it's a prophecy that this evil thing will happen and it will have a detrimental effect on the world, like, a, like something bad. Something bad will happen and the brave party of adventurers, what they do, they strive to prevent it, right? That's the classic. That's how it happens all, all the time. But they also mentioned Maybe it's the prophesized event is something good, something that people are awaiting. And wouldn't it be cool to have a campaign where instead of fighting against a prophecy that's bad coming true, if you were to have a campaign where the players fight for a prophecy to come true because it's a good prophecy, a savior will come, the hard times will end. Maybe not necessarily make one of the players be this messiah because that's kind of disinteresting, but maybe make them the, the generation before. Maybe make them the ones that have to pave the way for what's going to change. Maybe make them the, men the future mentors of the hero. That could be an original and interesting thing. It's worth exploring. Okay, number 10, Myth and Legend. If wars, plagues, discoveries and the like can be called regular world-shaking events. Regular world-shaking Them regular world-shaking events. <laughs> Mythic events succeed and surpass them. A mythic event might occur as the fulfillment of an ancient or long forgotten prophecy, or it might be an act of divine intervention. Once again, your current campaign probably provides a few ideas for the shape of this event. If you need inspiration, roll a d8 on the world shaking events table instead of the normal d10. Address the bullet point notes from the disaster but magnify the result to the grandest scale you can imagine. 
The rise or fall of a leader or era is the death or birth of a god, or the end of an age or the world. A cataclysmic disaster is a world drowning deluge, an ice age or a zombie apocalypse. An assault or invasion is a world war, a world spanning demonic incursion, the awakening of the threatening monster or the final clash between good and evil. A rebellion that thrones a god or gods or raises a new force such as a demon lord to divinity. A new organization is a world spanning empire or a pantheon of new gods. A discovery is a doomsday device or a portal to eldritch dimensions where world chattering cosmic horrors dwell. Hmm. Actually, the Witcher world, like the, the Witcher books, have a prophecy that prophesizes a world ending event, but it's climate change. Like, it's, it's regular, non magical climate change that's just gonna happen to the. By the way, spoilers! <laughs> uh, if, you, if you haven't read the other books, you, like, rewind this and mute me before I say that. Uh, <laughs> so, that's an interesting one, and there is a. There is, obvious, there is of course. A, let's, like, I was about to say another spoiler. Let's not say it. Or maybe like mute for, for ten seconds. There is there is of course a savior that's been prophesized in the book. Too. So that's like that's the drop. You can unmute now. Yeah, you haven't heard it if you are still muted, but yeah. Yeah. Tracking time. A calendar lets you record the passage of time in the campaign. More importantly, it says you plan ahead for the critical events that shake up the world. For simple time tracking, use a calendar for the current year. In the real world, pick a date to indicate the start of the campaign and make note of the days that the adventurers spend on their travels and various activities. The calendar tells you when the seasons change and the lunar cycle. More importantly, you can use your calendar to track important festivals and holidays as well as key events that shape your campaign. This method is a good starting point but the calendar of your world need not follow a modern calendar. If you want to customize your calendar with details unique to your world, consider these types of features. The basics. A fantasy world's calendar doesn't have to mirror the modern one, but it can. See the calendar of Harptor's sidebar, for example. Do the weeks of a month have names? What about specific days of each month, like the Eids, Nones, and Calends of the Roman calendar? Oh, I have a... about these. Like, that's very cool, that sounds very cool, but I wouldn't do it because players never remember them, and you never remember them, and that's a big deal. If, it's, if you're anything like me, and your players are anything like my players, you're not gonna remember the damn things till the very end of the campaign, the end included, so... Well, maybe, maybe that. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about this one. And also about the... I mentioned the Witcher books, and we mentioned the Tolkien books earlier, and how what I think about the Lord of the Rings. I honestly like the Witcher books much more than Lord of the Rings books, despite the fact that the, the world of the Witcher, it's paper thin, it's puddle deep, it's super shallow. Sapkowski only made enough of the world to facilitate his story, did very little. Uh, characters have the uh, postmodern quote unquote names where they're named like a real life volcano, or a town that holds a comic book convention, or that sort of thing, really. Or a CD that he was listening to at the time of writing a chapter, literally, that's actual three character names, sources, or three Witcher characters. So, yeah, he's not into world building, but the books are just better. Sorry, it's... It's speedy. It moves along. It's really brisk. It has great... It has some great cinematic moments. And I'm not a fan of the, of the Witcher games, and so many people think that's, like, a good story. The books are, like, so much better still. The Witcher books are some of the very few books that I've read twice. I nearly never read a book twice, but I've read those twice. So, yeah, I highly recommend it to anyone. Okay, let's get back to the calendar. Physical cycles. Determine when the seasons fall, marked by the solstices and equinoxes. Do the months correspond to the phases of the moon or moons? Do strange and magical effects occur at the same time as these phenomena? Sprinkle holy days throughout your calendar. Each significant deity in your world should have at least one holy day during the year, and some gods' holy days correspond to celestial phenomena, such as new moons or equinoxes. Holy days reflect the portfolio of a deity, a god of agriculture is honored in the harvest season, or significant events in the history of the deity's worship, such as the birth or death of a holy person, the date of a god's manifestation, the accession of the current high priest, and so on. 
certain holy days are civic events, observed by every citizen of a town where a god's temple can be found. Harvest festivals are often celebrations on a grand scale. Other holy days are important only to people particularly devoted to a single deity. Still, others are observed by priests who perform private rites and sacrifices inside their temples on certain days or specific times of the day, and some holy days are local, observed by the faithful of a specific temple. Give some thought to how priests and common folk celebrate holy days. Going into the temple, sitting in a pew and listening to a sermon is a mode of worship foreign to most fantasy religions. More commonly, celebrants offer sacrifices to the gods. The faithful bring animals to the temple to be slaughtered or burn incense as an offering. The wealthiest citizens bring the largest animals to flaunt their wealth and demonstrate their piety. People pour out libations at the graves of their ancestors. They spend all night vigils in darkened shrines or enjoy splendid feasts celebrating a god's bounty. Holy days provide the majority of the special celebrations in most calendars, but local or national festivals account for many others. The birthday of a monarch, the anniversary of a great victory in a war, craft festivals, market days and similar events provide excuses for local celebrations. Fantastic events. Since your setting is a fantasy world and not a mundane medieval society, and in a few events of an obviously magical nature. For example, perhaps a ghostly castle appears on a certain hill on the winter solstice every year, or every third full moon fills a glucanthrope to the particularly strong bloodlust. Also, the thirteenth night of every month could mark the ghostly wanderings of a long forgotten nomadic tribe. Extraordinary events such as the approach of a comet or lunar eclipse make good adventure elements, and you can drop them in your calendar whenever you want. Your calendar can tell you when there is a full moon or a lunar eclipse, but you can always fudge the date for a particular event. No, for a particular effect. The world of the Forgotten Realms is the calendar of Harptos, named after the long dead wizard who invented it. Each year of 365 days is divided into 12 months of 30 days each, which roughly correspond to months in the real world Gregorian calendar. Each month is divided into 3 10 days. Five special holidays fall between the months and mark the seasons. Another special holiday, Shield Meat, is inserted into the calendar after midwinter every four years, much like leap years in the modern Gregorian calendar. Month 1 Hammer Deep Winter. Okay, so it goes like this month number, then the name, and then there is a common name. I can imagine myself trying to remember this only to annoy my players with using these names in game and having them not know what is what. Imagine doing the same thing for days of the week. That's truly evil. Chaotic evil. Month 1, Hammer. Common name, Deep Winter. Annual Holiday, Midwinter. Quadrennial Holiday, Shield Meat. Month 2, Alturiak. Common name, The Claw of Winter. Month 3, Chess. Common name, The Claw of Sunset. Month 4, Tarsak. Common name, the Claw of Storms. Annual holiday, green grass. Month 5, Myrtul. Common name, the Melting. Month 6, Kythorn. Common name, the Time of Flowers. Month 7, Lame Rule. Common name, Summertide. Annual holiday, Midsummer. Month 8, Elysius. Common name, High Sun. Month 9, Elaint. Common name, the Fey Day. Annual holiday, I harvest tide. Month 10, Marpenoth. Common name, Leaf Fall. Month 11, Uktar. Common name, the Rotang. Annual holiday, the Feast of the Moon. And month 12, Night Hall. Common name, the Drowing Dawn. By the way, this guy over here, this illustration. He looks like he's drawn by Theresa Nielsen. She used to do Magic the Gathering art. If you're, if you're from that side of gaming, or if you're into role playing games, she also did art for Seventh Sea Nations art for the Seventh Sea role playing game rule book. It does look like, like her style. I don't know if it's drawn, drawn by her. She does the sort of idealized but very, very lifelike, very real life person like faces but still very much idealized and she does have this style where it's kind of retro with the um contour 
going through the line art showing through and the render yeah I, th I think it's probably drawn by her i don't know i don't know though i'm gonna have to take a look at the at the book credits is it called credits when it's on the book i don't know by the way i recommend 7c trying it as a, as a role playing game it's fun it lets you look from a very different perspective than dungeons and dragons it's a very cinematic over the top game it's fantasy too so really into fantasy that might still scratch your itch it's a different brand of fantasy than dnd and that uh it's more like the three musketeers kind of thing a lot of the countries feel that way more civilized brand of fantasy there's piracy too it's a fun game let's get back to the dnd dungeon master's guide this will be finished ending our campaign a campaign's ending should tie up all the threads of its beginning and middle but you don't have to take a campaign all the way to 20th level for it to be satisfying wrap up the campaign whenever your story reaches its natural conclusion make sure you allow space and time near the end of your campaign for the characters to finish up any personal goals their own stories need to end in a satisfying way just as the campaign story does ideally some of the characters' individual goals will be fulfilled by the ultimate goal of the final adventure. If this were a, a film, a feature film, it would have to be tied. They don't make a campaign where your story is your story and they have all their stories and you're pulling in separate directions. Give characters with unfinished goals a chance to finish them before the very end. Once the campaign has ended, a new one can begin. If you intend to run a new campaign for the same group of players using their previous character's action as the basis of legend gives them immediate investment in the new setting, let the new characters experience how the world has changed because of their old characters. In the end though, the new campaign is a new story with new protagonists. They shouldn't have to share the spotlight with the heroes of days gone by. Well, I don't necessarily agree with it. I feel like a lot of D&D is written as if the as if the players were all egotistical maniacs shaking for their status as the most powerful badass in the world. Like, that's not what role playing is about. It's not a power trip and it's not about, about satisfying one's vanity, feeling like you're the best, you're the hero. No. But then again, maybe, maybe a bunch of people in the fandom are like this. I don't know. I don't treat my players like fragile snowflakes that need validation. Play style by building a new world or adopting an existing one and creating the key events that launch your campaign. You determine what your campaign is about. Next, you have to decide how you want to run your campaign. What's the right way to run a campaign? That depends on your playstyle and the motivation of your players. Consider your players' tastes, your strengths as DM, table rules discussed in part 3, and the type of game you want to run. Describe to the players how you envision the game experience and let them give you input. The game is theirs too. Lay the groundwork early so your players can make informed choices and help you maintain the type of game you want to run. Consider the following two exaggerated examples of playstyle. Actually, before we get to it, I'd like to go on a little rant about something I read on, on Reddit. I read a thread about whether to let your players roll on stats or just go with an array. And I'm a firm believer that you should let them roll on stats, but that's neither here nor there. That's not what the rant is going to be about. In this rant, there was a player who was a strong opponent of uh, going with the array because he once played a game where he was a ranger and there was another ranger in the same party. And the other ranger rolled better on pretty much everything than him. And he said, oh, that completely ruined the game for, for me, even though the other ranger was a nice guy and, and all and all and all, because his character didn't contribute anything to the party and felt like a a little brother to the stronger ranger and i think that's such a wrong mindset if you made your characters actually characters rather than stat blocks you would have contributed you would have contributed for sure in one of my campaigns i play as the absolute weakest character in the party anyone could kill me if they were at half hp and i was at full top top with potions whatever they would have killed me easily I'm so weak, and I'm useless when it comes to most ability checks that influence anything. But my character, I mean, I'm gonna say not so modestly, contributes probably the most to the campaign just because he's an interesting character. He ties the party together in a way. 
Uh, that's what you what you should strive for. Your characters shouldn't be just a block of stats. You should strive to create a an interesting character, an interesting personality for the campaign if you're a player. All right, now now let's consider the following two exaggerated examples of playstyle. Playstyle one: hack and slash. The adventurers kick in the dungeon door, fight the monsters, and grab the treasure. This style of play is straightforward, fun, exciting, and action-oriented. Players spend relatively little time developing personas for their characters, role-playing non-combat situations, or discussing anything other than the immediate dangers of the dungeon. In such a game, the adventurers face clearly evil monsters and opponents, and casually meet clearly good and helpful NPCs. Don't expect the adventurers to anguish over what to do with prisoners, or to debate whether it's right or wrong to invade and wipe out over a lair. Don't track money or time spent in town. Once you've completed a task, send the adventurers back into the action as quickly as possible. Character motivation need be no more developed than a desire to kill monsters and acquire treasure. This is horrible, by the way. This sounds absolutely horrible. It's gonna get boring after three games, trust me. When I read this style of play is straightforward, fun, exciting. It's not fun and it's not exciting, let me tell you. I mean, I've, I've played games that are mostly... Com just no. I'm gonna say just no. Don't. No. If you're into that sort of gameplay, get out of my stream. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You, you need not get out of my stream. Part. I've played with people who are into this too. It gets boring very quickly. And it's very video game-like. That's a, that's a big minus for me. Anyway, immersive storytelling. Water deep. It's threatened by political turmoil. The adventurers must convince the masked lords, the city's secret rulers, to resolve their differences, but can do so only after both the characters and the lords have come to terms with their differing outlooks and agendas. This style of gaming is deep, complex and challenging. Focus isn't on combat, but on negotiations, political maneuverings and character interaction. A whole game session might pass without a single attack roll. In this style of game, the NPCs are as complex and richly detailed as the adventurers, Although the focus lies on motivation and personality, not game statistics, expect long discussions from each player about what his or her character does and why. Going to the temple to ask a priest for advice can be as important an encounter as fighting orcs, and don't expect the adventurers to fight the orcs at all unless they are motivated to do so. A character will sometimes take actions against the player's better judgment, because that's what the character would do. Since combat isn't the focus, Game rules take a backseat to character development. Ability check modifiers and skill proficiencies take precedence over combat bonuses. Feel free to change or ignore the rules to fit the, role the player's role-playing needs, using the advice presented in part 3 of this book. Okay, now, this style of play, it doesn't necessarily have to be about a political intrigue. You can have a very militant campaign setting and a very brutal way of life to the characters and still play in that style and it's gonna be better, I promise you. But other than that, I, I, I mostly agree, yeah. I, I, I agree, except for that little part where they suggest that they uh, expect long digressions from each player about what his or her character does and why. No, you don't need to ask them why. They shouldn't say why, it's gonna make the games just longer. They just do what they want to do, but they do it in character because they're the sort of player. They don't explain why it's unnecessary, it just makes games longer. Just do what you want to do and be in character, play as them. I, I personally like dialogue the most in RPGs. When two of your players are discussing something in character and it gets heated, it gets interesting, maybe they have different takes, maybe they want to go different ways, maybe they want to take the party different ways or or make a very different decision at a crucial point in the campaign, and that's interesting. And players can get really into it too. Something in between. The style of play in most campaigns falls between these two extremes. There's plenty of action, but the campaign offers an ongoing storyline and interaction between characters as well. Players develop their characters' motivations and relish the chance to prove their skills in combat. To maintain the balance, provide a mixture of role-playing encounters and combat encounters. Even in a dungeon setting, you can present NPCs that aren't meant to be fought, but rather helped out, negotiated with, or talked to. Think about your preferred style of play by considering these questions. Are you a fan of realism and gritty consequences, or are you more, fo more focused on making the game seem like an action movie? 
Do you want the game to maintain a sense of medieval fantasy, or do you want to explore alternate timelines or modern thinking? Do you want to maintain a serious tone, or is humour your goal? Even if you are serious, is the action light-hearted or intense? Is bold action key, or do the players need to be thoughtful and cautious? Do you like to plan thoroughly in advance, or do you prefer improvising on the spot? Is the game full of varied D&D elements, or does it centre on a theme such as horror? Is the game for all ages, or does it involve mature themes? Are you comfortable with moral ambiguities, such as allowing the characters to explore whether the end justifies the means, or are you happier with straightforward heroic principles such as justice, sacrifice, and helping the downtrodden? This one, I think, the, the question about improvisation, that's an important one. Whether or not you like be prepared for everything, you like to write out everything ahead of time, I think you need to accept that you're gonna have to improvise, that you're gonna want to improvise in your game as a dungeon master, because if you're not ready to improvise, you're gonna do everything to prevent players from skipping, quote-unquote, your encounter, or derailing, quote-unquote, your meticulously prepared game. So you're gonna have to accept that you, you will be improvising that's my advice you have to accept that it's the it's the lifeblood of rpgs that makes them different from from video games you can get stuff that you'd never expect for example if you're running a, a game and there's a combat encounter or something your players can do anything they could climb a tree they could climb a tree and it could change the the course of the entire campaign and in the video games developers aren't gonna think about okay so we have this tree maybe add an option to climb it Make a fork at the very beginning of the game, where it triples the actual development time because you're gonna have a completely different outcome uh, by climbing this tree. And you can do that by being ready to improvise enough in your game. And that's uh, the magic of tabletop. Alright, and now we go to character names. Part of your campaign style has to do with naming characters. It's a good idea to establish some ground rules with your players at the start of a new campaign. In a group consisting of Sithis, Ravok, and Astriana, and Chiron, the human fighter named Bob II, sticks out, especially when he's identical to Bob I, who was killed by kobolds. If everyone takes a light-hearted approach to names, that's fine. If the group would rather take the characters and the names a little more seriously, urge Bob's player to come up with a more appropriate name. Player character names should match each other in flavor and concept, and they should also match the flavor of your campaign world. So should the non-player characters' names and place names you create. Ravok and Chiron don't want to undertake a quest for Lord Cupcake, visit Gundrop Island, or take down a crazy wizard named Ray. I kind of agree with that, to be honest. Poor Bob, but I still kind of agree with it. It's not that hard to make up a name. You can you can help your players too if they're not into it. But if you're a DM and you're, you're having trouble coming up with names, that's the ultimate pain, because there's no one who's going to help you do it. It can be funny, I agree. Actually, it can be unintentionally funny. A timeless classic is when you try very, very hard to come up with serious names as a DM and the players still find a way to twist them or mispronounce them or whatever to make them funny. Good times, fun times, very funny. Mispronounced names, fun times unless you're a, you're a DM. Ah, uh, it's, still, it's still kind of sometimes fun. Anyway, continuing or episodic campaigns. The backbone of a campaign is a connected series of adventures, but you can connect them in two different ways. In a continuing campaign, the connected adventures share a sense of larger purpose or a recurring theme or themes. The adventures might feature returning villains, grand conspiracies, or a single mastermind who's ultimately behind every adventure of the campaign. A campaign designed with a theme and a story arc in mind can feel like a great fantasy epic. The players derive the satisfaction of knowing the actions they take during one adventure matter in the next. Plotting and running that kind of campaign can be demanding on the DM, but the payoff is great and memorable story. An episodic campaign, in contrast, is like a television show, where each week's episode is a self-contained story that doesn't play into any overarching plot. It might be built on a premise that explains its nature. The player characters are adventurers for hire, or explorers venturing into the unknown and facing a string of unrelated dangers. They might even be archaeologists venturing into one ancient ruin after another in search of artifacts. An episodic game like this lets you create adventures or buy published ones and drop them into your campaign without worrying about how they fit. The adventures that came before and follow after. Campaign theme. A theme in a campaign, as in a work of literature, expresses the deeper meaning of a story 
the fundamental elements of human experience that the story explores. Your campaign doesn't have to be a work of literature, but can still draw on common themes and lend a distinctive flavor to its stories. Consider these examples. Ooh, this is like this is like a thing I like. A campaign about confronting the inevitability of mortality, whether embodied in undead monsters or expressing through the death of loved ones. A campaign revolving around an insidious evil, whether dark gods, monstrous races such as Yuan-Ti or creatures of unknown realms, far removed from mortal concerns. If serious could confront this evil, they must face the selfish, cruel tendencies of their own kind as well. A campaign featuring troubled heroes who confront not only the savagery of the bestial creatures of the world, but also the beast within. The rage and fury that lies in their own hearts. A campaign exploring insatiable thirst for power and domination whether embodied by the hosts of nine hells, or by humanoid rulers bent on conquering the world. A theme is a very cool thing in a story. I like to have a theme, but for a role-playing game it's much more difficult than for a, a video game story. It's easy to put in a theme for a story where players have a say and a strong say in where things will go. It's kind of difficult. I have never actually managed to do that one successfully in a campaign. But I'm gonna try. And I think my current take on it is I'm gonna let the campaign start without any theme in mind, any theme at all. And if after a couple of games an idea emerges that sort of meshes with what we've been doing before, I'm gonna try to push everything to start pushing everything in that direction. But it's tricky. You might want death as the main theme of your campaign, and your characters do things that are completely not on theme, and they don't care about the theme of death. It's not gonna be a story that's that way. Like, no matter what you do as a DM, it's not gonna be like that, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't force it. There's some of the, the things they mentioned, like the second one, I don't get the theme. Revolving around insidious evil, morality could be a theme of a campaign. But death is a very cool theme. You don't see it that much lately. The last death, like really death-themed work of fiction I can think of, probably Harry Potter, honestly. That has a strong theme of death, and it's a children's book. It, by the way, I really like it. I really like the book series. Thirst of Full Power, that's another weak theme. Only the first one is a strong theme. The, the other three are basically about murder hobos. Okay. With a theme such as confrontation with mortality, you can craft a broad range of adventures that aren't necessarily connected by a common villain. One adventure might feature the dead bursting from their graves and threatening to overwhelm a whole town. In the next adventure, a mad wizard creates a flesh golem in an effort to revive his lost love. The villain could go to extreme lengths to achieve immortality to avoid confronting its own demise. The adventurers might help a ghost accept death and move on. Or one of the adventurers might even become a ghost. Ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Did you play as a ghost? Do they have rules for this sort of thing? Probably don't have rules, you'd have to improvise, but... Variations on a theme. Making things up once in a while allows your players to enjoy a variety of adventures. Even a tightly themed campaign can straight now and then. If your campaign heavily involves intrigue, mystery and role playing, your players might enjoy the occasional dungeon crawl, especially if the dungeon is revealed to relate to a larger plot in the campaign. If most of your adventures are dungeon expeditions, shift gears with a tense urban mystery and eventually lead the party into a dungeon crawl in an abandoned building or tower. If you run horror adventures week after week, try using a villain who turns out to be ordinary, perhaps even silly. Comic relief is a great variation on almost any D&D campaign, though players usually provide it themselves. Tears of play. As characters grow in power, their ability to change the world around them grows with them. It helps to think ahead when creating your campaign to account for this change. If the players make a greater impact on their world, they face greater danger, whether they want to or not. But powerful factions see them as a threat and plot against them, while friendly ones fought their favor in hopes of striking a useful alliance. The tiers of play represent the ideal milestones for introducing new world-shaking events to the campaign. If the characters resolve one event, a new danger arises or the plot trouble transforms into a new threat in response to the character's actions. Events need to grow in magnitude and scope, increasing the stakes and drama as the characters become increasingly powerful. This approach also allows you to break your design and work down into smaller pieces. Create materials such as adventures, NPCs, maps and so on for one tier at a time. You don't need to worry about the details of the next tier as the characters approach it. 
even better as the campaign takes unexpected turns in response to the player's choices. You don't have to worry about redoing much work. I strongly recommend to work one game at a time and think maybe three games at a time, plus the ending. Don't go further than that, because if you go further than that, you're gonna be really reluctant to let players change things up. And they're gonna want to change things up. Levels 1 to 4 Local Heroes Characters in this tier are still learning the range of class features that define them, including their choice of specialization. Even first level characters are heroes, set apart from the common people by natural characteristics, learned skills and the hint of a greater destiny that lies before them. At the start of their careers, characters use first and second level spells and wield mundane gear. The magic items they find include common consumable items, potions and scrolls, and a very few uncommon permanent items. The magic can have a big impact in a single encounter, but it doesn't change the course of an adventure. The fate of a village might hang on the success or failure of low-level adventurers who trust their lives to their fledgling abilities. These characters navigate dangerous terrain and explore haunted crypts where they can expect to fight savage orcs, ferocious wolves, giant spiders, evil cultists, bloodthirsty ghouls, and hired thugs. If they face even a young dragon, they're better off avoiding a fight. Yeah, a dragon whelp could probably kill off uh, an entire party of people level 4. I didn't know the stats for it though. Levels 5 to 10, Heroes of the Realm. By the time they reach this tier, adventurers have mastered the basics of their class features. Though they continue to improve throughout these levels, they have found their place in the world and have begun to involve themselves in the dangers that surround them. Dedicated spellcasters learn third level spells at the start of this tier. Suddenly characters can fly, damage large numbers of foes with fireball and lightning bolt, and even breathe underwater. They master 5th level spells by the end of this tier, and spells such as teleportation circles, crying, flame strike, legend lore and raise dead can have a significant impact on their adventures. They start acquiring more permanent magic items on common and rare ones, which will serve them for the rest of their careers. The fate of a region might depend on the adventures that characters of level 5 to 10 undertake. These adventurers venture into fearsome wilds and ancient ruins where they confront savage giants, ferocious hydras, fearless golems, evil yuan ti scheming devils, bloodthirsty demons, crafty mind flayers and draw assassins. They might have a chance of defeating a young dragon that has established a lair but not yet extended its reach far into the surrounding territory. Levels 11 to 16 Masters of the Realm by 11th level, characters are shining examples of courage and determination, true paragons in the world, set well apart from the masses. At this tier, adventurers are far more versatile than they were at lower levels, and they can usually find the right tool for a given challenge. Dedicated spellcasters gain access to 6th level spells at 11th level, including spells that completely change the way adventurers interact with the world. Their big flashy spells are significant in combat, disintegrate the late barrier, and heal for example, but behind the scenes spells such as Word of Recall, Find the Past, Contingency, Teleport and True Seeing out of the way players approach their adventures. Each spell level after that point introduces new effects with an equally large impact. The adventurers find rare magic items and very rare ones and bestow similarly powerful abilities. The fate of a nation or even the world depends on momentous quests that such characters undertake. Adventurers explore uncharted regions and delve into long-forgotten dungeons where they confront terrible masterminds of the lower planes, cunning rakshasas and beholders, and hungry purple worms. They might encounter and even defeat a powerful adult dragon that has established a lair and a significant presence in the world. At this tier, adventurers make their mark on the world in a variety of ways, from the consequences of the adventures to the manner in which they spend their hard-worn treasure and exploit the well-deserved reputations. Characters of this level construct fortresses on land, feed them by local rulers, they found guilds, temples or martial orders, they take on apprentices or students of their own, they broker peace between nations or lead them into war, and their formidable reputations attract the attention of very powerful foes. This sort of thing, a person as a, as a dungeon master and a, and a connoisseur of stories, I don't really like that much storytelling wise. It, Everything is much less personal and much more cartoony, I'd like to say. It's stretched to the outside of real life proportions. 
it doesn't feel the same it doesn't feel personal it doesn't feel like a story that's grounded so much i personally am not very much interested in founding temples or martial orders or taking apprentices or building keeps that sort of thing it's much less interesting than just being a guy in the world with his own goal maybe his personal vengeance maybe a quest to find something that's lost to him nobody knows what he's doing and it doesn't really change the world around him all he does is very personal to him and his story is personal that sort of thing i like that sort of thing it's a it's like the the marvel superheroes sort of deal not my favorite anyway levels 17 to 20 masters of the world by 17th level characters have superhero capabilities the deeds and adventures are the stuff of legend Originally, people can hardly dream of such heights of power or such terrible dangers. Dedicated spellcasters of this tier wield earth shattering ninth level spells such as Wish, Gate, Storm of Vengeance, and Astral Projections. Characters with several rare and very rare magic items at their disposal and begin discovering legendary items such as a Vorpal Sword or a Staff of the Magi. Adventures at these levels have far reaching consequences, possibly determining the fate of millions in the material plane and even places beyond. Characters traverse otherworldly realms and explore demi planes and other extra planar locales where they fight savage battle of demons, titans, and arch devils, lich archmages, and even avatars of the gods themselves. The dragons they encounter are worms of tremendous power, whose sleep troubles kingdoms and whose waking threatens existence itself. Characters who reach 20th level have attained the pinnacle of mortal achievement. Their deeds are recorded in the annals of history and recounted by bards for centuries. The ultimate destiny is come to pass. A cleric might be taken up into the heavens to serve as God's right hand. A warlock could become a patron to other war warlocks. Perhaps a wizard unlocks the secret to immortality, or in death, and spends eons exploring the farthest reaches of the multiverse. A druid might become one with the lands, transforming to a nature spirit of a particular place or an aspect of the wild. Other characters could found clans or dynasties that revere the memory of their honored ancestors from generation to generation. Great masterpieces of epic literature that are sung and taught for thousands of years, establish guilds or orders that keep the adventurers, principles, and dreams alive. Reaching this point doesn't necessarily dictate the end of the campaign. These powerful characters might be called on to undertake grand adventures on the cosmic stage. As a result of these adventures, their capabilities can continue to evolve. Characters gain no more levels at this point, but they can still advance in meaningful ways and continue performing epic deeds that resound throughout the multiverse. Chapter 7 details epic boons you can use as rewards for the characters to maintain a sense of progress. When I eventually do a D&D campaign, I want to... I want to somehow not do that. The characters can become powerful. It's natural to the sort of game, so the Dungeons & Dragons is designed with that in mind. But I'd like to make it so that the character's name does not necessarily correspond to their power. Maybe I'll, I'll just end the campaign before that point. That's an option too. I feel like this sort of thing, that's very much ego stroking. The adventure should be the reward. The gaming is the reward in and of itself. Me as a player, I'm never in it to get the fictional gold or fictional fame or fictional anything. I want to go through an interesting story. I don't want this. I don't want praise from NPCs like you get in video games and everybody burying their head and you have unlocked the secrets of lichdom and bandions exploring the furthest reaches of the multiverse or are taken to heaven to serve as a god's right hand like no come on if you were to watch that sort of thing on a cinema screen that would be so boring Ugh. imagine a good fantasy movie for example lord of the rings a lot of the characters are still weak at the end, like as weak or close to as weak as they were towards the beginning. Frodo especially, I mean Frodo especially, because a lot of what he does is just personal sacrifice. He's a hero, but he suffers a terrible fate and he retires to the lands of the elves beyond the sea. And it's a bittersweet end. Yeah, that's, that's the sort of thing people like seeing on screen, like I would. It's not about ego stroking or rewards, none of that garbage, none of that. Starting at higher level, experienced players familiar with the capabilities of the character classes and impatient for more significant adventures might welcome the idea of starting a campaign with characters above first level. 
Creating a higher level character uses the same character creation steps outlined in the player's handbook such as character has more hit points, class features and spells and probably starts with better equipment. Starting equipment for characters above first level is entirely at your discretion since you give out treasure at your own pace. That said, you can use the starting equipment table as guide. Okay, so I have a table here. Character level, first to fourth, normal starting equipment. Like low magic campaign is normal starting equipment. Standard campaign is normal starting equipment and high magic campaign is normal starting equipment. Fifth to tenth, 500 GP plus, only 10 times 25 GP. Normal starting equipment in a low magic campaign. In a standard campaign, that's 500 GP plus 1d10 times 25 GP. Normal starting equipment. And high magic campaign, 500 GP plus 1d10 times 25 GP. One uncommon magic item. Normal starting equipment. 11 to 16, 5000 GP plus 1d10 times 250 GP. One uncommon magic item. Normal starting equipment. Yeah, this is boring. Start this campaign, you can get two uncommon magic items at level between 11 and 16. And in a high magic campaign, you can get three uncommon magic items, one rare item, and normal starting equipment. And if you start at 17th to 20th, which I can't imagine anyone doing, but in the low magic campaign, you still get two uncommon magic items. A standard one, you would get two uncommon, one ram, and a normal starting equipment. In a high magic campaign, three uncommon ones, two rare, one very rare. That's boring. Boring stuff. Flavors of Fantasy Dungeons & Dragons is a fantasy game, but the broad category encompasses a lot of variety. Many different flavors of fantasy exist in fiction and film. If you want a horrific campaign inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft or Clark Ashton Smith, or do you envision a world of muscled barbarians and nimble thieves along the lines of classic sword and sorcery books by Robert E. Howard and Fritz Lieber, your choice can have an impact on the flavor of your campaign. I can't imagine anybody wanting to do an HP Lovecraft inspired campaign to choose Dungeons and Dragons. Like you have to be out of your mind. There is literally an RPG system called Call of Cthulhu and it's super popular too. Come on Hasbro, who are you kidding? Heroic Fantasy Heroic Fantasy is the baseline assumed by the D&D rules. The player's handbook describes this baseline. A multitude of humanoid races coexist with humans in fantastic worlds. Adventurers bring magical powers to bear against the monstrous threats they face. These characters typically come from ordinary backgrounds, but something impels them into an adventure in life. Impelled, good word, are the heroes of the campaign, but they might not be truly heroic, instead pursuing this life for selfish reasons. Technology and society are based on medieval norms, though the culture isn't necessarily European. Campaigns often revolve around delving into ancient dungeons in search of treasure, or in an effort to destroy monsters or villains. This genre is also common in fantasy fiction. Most novels set in the Forgotten Realms are best described as heroic fantasy, following in the footsteps of many of the authors listed in Appendix E, the player's handbook. I feel like in the, in the way the art is presented for it, and a lot of things are presented for it, technology and society are not based on medieval norms. It's a bit of a shame. It could stand to be much more hard-boiled. If or when I run d and I'm gonna strive to do this one right. Make it a low technology setting and believable norms for a world that doesn't have instant travel for the average person. People are not that civilized, there, are, there isn't sanitation and easily available food for everyone even. Depends on what campaign setting you run. I guess that's fair. Forgotten Realms, I feel like, is not at all medieval. Like, that's the one that I feel is not at all medieval in its norms and, and standards. I don't know much about Eberron or, or Dark Sun. I know a bit about Planescape, but that one isn't medieval at all. The one I have a problem with is specifically Forgotten Realms. Ah, I'll take a sip of my drink. And Sword and Sorcery. A grim hawking fighter disembowels the high priest of the serpent god on his own altar. That's, that's gonna be the Robert Howard inspired one, I bet. Just the first sentence. A grim hawking fighter disembowels the high priest of the serpent god on his own altar. A laughing rogue spends ill gotten gains on cheap wine in filthy taverns. Hardy adventurers venture into the unexplored jungle in search of the fabled city of golden masks. 
a sword and sorcery campaign emulates some of the classic works of fantasy fiction, a tradition that goes back to the roots of the game. Here you'll find a dark gritty world of evil sorcerers and decadent cities where the protagonists are motivated more by greed and self-interest than by altruistic virtue. Fighter, rogue, barbarian characters tend to be far more common than wizards, clerics or paladins. In such a pulp fantasy setting those who wield magic often symbolize the decadence and corruption of civilization and wizards are the classic villains of these settings. Magic items are therefore rare and often dangerous. Certain Dungeons & Dragons novels follow the footsteps of classic sword and sorcery novels. The world of Athas is featured in numerous Dark Sun game products. With its heroic gladiators and tyrannical sorcerer king belongs squarely in this genre. So anyway, one more thought on why I think Forgotten Realms is not medieval in the way they're doing it now in art and in, in generally anything. I feel like it's very cosmopolitan and everybody is very well off. Historically, people were far more tribal and primitive and tightly knit and everything was hard to get. What you couldn't make by hand was hard to get a lot of the times. And also, Forgotten Realms has a nearly cataclysmic event every few hundred years. It should stand to reason that if it's such a tumultuous setting, people should be poor, people should have a hard time. There should be much more rural, underdeveloped regions where people have never seen anything or anyone from outside the village their entire lives and we have these huge sprawling cosmopolitan cities that are well off and everyone's civilized and everyone's clean and they have stuff that doesn't really feel medieval for me i'm not for the grim dark fantasy settings necessarily but it just i don't know maybe i'm just not too into Forgotten Realms. But then again, I do want to. I do want to make a Forgotten Realms campaign. Let me tell you my pitch for for the campaign I want to run. Or rather, it's not going to be a campaign. It's going to be like a one game or a mini campaign, like a tiny thing. I'm going to write it and try to wrap it up in a way where it takes three games or four games, something like that. And I want to play it with people from the internet. Somewhere. Someone I find on Reddit, anyone. So here's the thing. I want to make it so that all the player characters start on the way to a leper colony in Kalimshan. Every character has to be written in... I assume you're a new DM. No, I'm not a new DM, actually. I've been a DM for seven years, but, but, I am new. I am new to Dungeons & Dragons, specifically. And you got that right. I, I used to be a DM for Fate Fudge Edition and Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay for these seven years, and I now want to branch out. Right? I want to try Dungeons & Dragons because it's so popular, it's so easy to find people for Dungeons & Dragons and that's the main reason I want to get into it. But I also like a lot of the older Dungeons & Dragons PC games. I think they're, they're doing a decent job a lot of the time. I like Icendale 1 for its great music and, and art and I like Planescape Torment because Planescape is a very interesting setting and that game is absolutely well written and I'd like to model the way I lead Dungeons & Dragons in the future on these depictions, because I think they're pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, and back to the, 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 the campaign I want to run. I want to run a campaign where everyone, every player play character, has a goal in getting to that leper colony, or maybe they're sent there against their own will, and everything will happen in this leper colony. There's going to be a bunch of poor people, it's going to be low technology, it's going to be low magic probably, they're not going to be very well off, but it's not going to be too grim dark. There's going to be a, a cult of Bashaba in there, that's a bit of a spoiler, but I know I, I want to put that in. And there's going to be a conflict of two cities of lepers that have emerged in there, in this leper colony. And they're going to be new people in that whole canyon, because the leper colony is going to be in a canyon where it's very hard to get out. They could try to do the things, the, the Wild West style. They have the, the power, obviously, because they're adventurers. They have, they're going to have some spells and they're going to have some military might and they could try to run the place or they could join one of the camps or they could anyway i don't want to i don't want to explore the story too much on the stream but that's the that's the gist of what i want to do and i think it's gonna work pretty well i've done some reading for it and i know that kalimshan is pretty it fits pretty well because it's just fresh out of a war and it's probably not doing too great. It has deserts, obviously. I'm going to draw my own tokens for it and my own maps for it. I'm going to try to draw influences from Arabic, Turkish, Middle Eastern stuff. It could be an interesting aesthetic. I don't know. I have, I have some ideas for it. I just need to get through this book. And I'm going through this at a glacial pace, let me tell you. And I am very excited about it, too.
Anyway, anyway, anyway. Epic fantasy. A devout paladin in gleaming plate armor braces her lance as she charges a dragon, bidding farewell to his dear love. A noble wizard sets forth on a quest to close the gate to the Nine Hells, which has opened in the remote wilderness. A close-knit band of loyal friends strives to overcome the forces of a tyrannical overlord. An epic fantasy campaign emphasizes the conflict between good and evil as a prominent element of the game, with the adventurers more or less squarely on the side of good. These characters are heroes in the best sense, driven by a higher purpose than selfish gain or ambition, and facing incredible dangers without blinking. Characters might struggle with moral quandaries, fighting the evil tendencies within themselves as well as the evil that threatens the world. And the stories of these campaigns often include an element of romance, tragic affairs between star-crossed lovers, passions that transcend even death, and chaste adoration between devout knights and the monarchs and nobles they serve. The novels of the Dragonlance saga exemplify the tradition of epic fantasy in D&D. Mythic Fantasy When an angry god tries time and again to destroy him, a clever rogue makes the long journey home from war. Braiding the, the terrifying guardians of the underworld, a noble warrior ventures into the darkness to retrieve the soul of her lost love. Calling on the divine parentage, a group of demigods undertake twelve labors to win the god's blessing for other mortals. The mythic fantasy campaign draws on the themes and stories of ancient myth and legend, from Gilgamesh to Kuhulan. Adventurers attempt mighty feats of legend, aided or hindered by the gods or their agents, and they might have divine blood themselves. The monsters and villains they face probably have a similar origin. The Minotaur in the dungeon isn't another bull-headed humanoid, but THE Minotaur, misbegotten offspring of a philandering god. Adventurers might lead the heroes throughout a series of trials to the realms of the gods in search of a gift or favour. Such a campaign can draw on the myths and legends of any culture, not just the familiar Greek tales. Dark Fantasy I don't want to do a Dark Fantasy one, by the way. I want to I want to make a more gritty world, but not necessarily dark. Dark fantasy. Vampires brood on the battlements of their cursed castle with necromancers toil in dark dungeons to create horrid serpents made of dead flesh. Devils corrupt the innocent and werewolves prowl the night. All of these elements evoke horrific aspects of the fantasy genre. If you want to put a horror spin on your campaign, you have plenty of material to work with. The monster manual is full of creatures that perfectly suit a storyline of supernatural horror. The most important element of a, such a campaign, though, isn't covered by the rules. Dark fantasy setting requires an atmosphere of building dread created through careful pacing and evocative description. Your players contribute to, they have to be willing to embrace the mood you're trying to evoke. Whether you want to run a full-fledged dark fantasy campaign or a single creepy adventure, you should discuss your plans with the players ahead of time to make sure they're on board. Horror can be intense and personal, and not everyone is comfortable with such a game. Yeah, that's pretty important. I mean, you should probably talk to your players about these sorts of things, whether, you're, whether you want to do a, a horror one or a dark fantasy, or whatever the genre, you should probably talk about what you want and what the players want, because it's not going to be just your game, and it's not going to be just the player's game, and you have to kind of reach a compromise. Yeah, session zero is very important to establish guidelines. If you're playing with people you've played with before and you've or, or you know very well and you've known them long, maybe you can skip the session zero, but uh, you should probably do it, right? You should probably do it nine times out of ten. Eventually, I'm going to have to look for players, right? Because I want people from the internet. And I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, to be honest. I'm going to have to want to talk to them before. Novels and game products set in Ravenloft Demiplane of Dread explore dark fantasy elements in a D&D context. What VTT are you going to use? I'm probably going to use Roll20 for my first one. Just because I've played as a player on Roll20 and I can use it right now. And after that I'm, I'd like to explore different things. Because I don't like Roll20 all that much. I've also been thinking about using something that's not meant for running Dungeons and Dragons or running any tabletop games, I was thinking about using a collaborative drawing program for my games so that I would draw a map and start with it as, as the base, right, and have why reinvent the wheel. Well, 
The reason is because I, I don't really like the idea of this drag a token across the map. It feels very video game style. I'd like something more bare bones because I have an idea how I'd like it to look but I'm not sure if I can think of a software that I like. As a, as a DM in, in, the, in the past I used Theatre of the Mind only. We played it in real life so I didn't use minis and I didn't use software but now that I've tried DMD as a player and now I'm learning it to be a DM I've tried it on Roll20 like I mentioned and it worked, it's fine, but it's not really what I'm looking for. The maps define everything very strongly and I would like my maps to define the adventure much less. I would like more of it to happen in the imagination. I only use maps when position is important. I think we're on the same page for that one. I don't want to use maps too much. I'm going to use maps only for combat and only where I feel like I really need to. Say my games are about 50-50 between map and theater of the mind. I approve, like I do basically the same thing, so you must be right. <laughs> anyway, intrigue. The corrupt vizier schemes with the Baron's oldest daughter to assassinate the Baron. A hobgoblin army sends doppelganger spies to infiltrate the city before the invasion. At the embassy board, the spy in the royal court makes contact with his employer. Political intrigue, espionage, sabotage and similar cloak and dagger activities can provide the basis for an exciting D&D campaign. In this kind of game, the characters might care more about skill training and making contacts than about attack spells and magic weapons. Role-playing and social interaction take on greater importance than combat, and the party might go for several sessions without seeing a monster. Again, make sure your players know ahead of time that you want to run this kind of campaign. Otherwise, the player might create a defense-focused dwarf paladin, only to find he is out of place among half-elf diplomats and tiefling spies. The Brimstone Angels novel by Aaron M. Evans focuses on intrigue in the Forgotten Realms setting, from the backstabbing politics of the Nine Hells to the contested succession of Cormirian royalty. Mystery Who stole three legendary magic weapons and hid them away in a remote dungeon, leaving a cryptic clue to their location? Who placed the Duke into a magical slumber, and what can be done to awaken him? Who murdered the Guildmaster, and how did the killer get into the Guild's locked vault? A mystery-themed campaign puts the characters in the role of investigators, perhaps travelling from town to town to crack tough cases the local authorities can't handle. Such a campaign emphasises puzzles and problem-solving in addition to combat prowess. The larger mystery might even set the stage for the whole campaign. Why did someone kill the character's mentor, setting them on the path of adventure? Who really controls the cult of the Red Hand? In this case, the characters might uncover clues. The greater mystery, only once in a while, Individual adventures might be at best tangentially related to that theme, I'm pretty sure I read that wrong. A diet of nothing but puzzles can become frustrating, so be sure to mix up the kind of encounters you present. Novels and various D&D settings have explored the mystery genre with a fantasy twist, in particular Murder and Cormier by Chet Williamson, Murder and Halrua by Richard S. Mayers and Spellstorm by Ed Greenwood are mysteries set in the Forgotten Realms. Murder and Tarsis by John Maddox Roberts takes the same approach in the Dragonlance setting. Rosh Buckling. Rapier-wielding sailors fight off hoarding Sahuagin. Ghouls lurk in derelict ships waiting to devour treasure hunters. Dashing rogues and charming paladins weave their way through palace entries and leap from balconies onto waiting horses below. The swashbuckling adventurers of pirates and musketeers suggest opportunities for dynamic campaign. The cactus typically spend more time in cities, royal courts and seafaring vessels than in dungeon delves, making interaction skills important though not to the extent of a pure intrigue campaign. Nevertheless, the heroes might end up in classic dungeon situations, such as searching storm sewers beneath the palace to find the evil duke's hidden chambers. A good example of a swashbuckling rogue in the Forgotten Realms is Jack Ravenwild, who appears in novels by Richard Baker, City of Ravens and Prince of Ravens. War. A hobgoblin army marches towards the city, leading elephants and giants to batter down the stronghold's wall and walls and ramparts. Dragons wheel above the barbarian hordes, scattering enemies as the raging warriors cut a swath through the field and forest. Salamander's master, Muster, and Ephrites' command, poised to assault an astral fortress. Warfare is a fantasy world, in a fantasy world is rife with opportunities for adventure. A war campaign isn't generally concerned with specifics of troop movements, but instead focuses on the heroes whose actions turn the tide of battle. Characters carry out specific missions. Capture a magical standard that empowers undead armies, gather reinforcements to break a siege, or cut through the enemy's flank to reach a demonic commander. In other situations, the party supports the larger army by holding a strategic location until reinforcements arrive. 
killing enemy scouts before they can report or cutting off supply lines. And information gathering and diplomatic missions can, su can supplement the more combat-oriented adventures. The War of the Lance in the Dragonlance Chronicles novels and the War of the Spider Queen in the novel series of the same name are prominent examples of wars in D&D novels. Another difficult word. Is it Wushu? Wusha? Chinese difficult. But I know what it is. When a sensei disappears mysteriously, her young students must take her place and hunt down the Oni, terrorizing their village. Accomplished heroes, masters of their respective martial arts, return home to free their village from an evil hobgoblin warlord. The Rakshasa masters a nearby monastery, performs rituals to raise troubled ghosts from their rest. The campaign that draws on elements of Asian martial arts movies, movies is a perfect match for D&D. Players can define the appearance of their characters and gear however they like for the campaign, and spells need only minor flavor changes so that they better reflect such a setting. For example, when the characters use spells or special abilities that teleport them short distances, they actually make high-flying acrobatic leaps. Ability checks to climb don't involve careful searching for holds, but let characters bounce up walls from tree to tree. Warriors stun their opponents by striking pressure points. Flavorful descriptions of actions in the game don't change the nuts and bolts of the rules, but they make all the difference in the feel of the campaign. Similarly, a class doesn't need new rules to reflect a cultural difference. A new name can do the trick. A traditional Chinese wuxia hero might be a paladin who has a sword called Oath of Vengeance, while a Japanese samurai might be a paladin with a particular oath of devotion, Bushido, that includes fealty to a lord, daimyo, among its tenets. A ninja is a monk who pursues the way of shadow. With a called Wu Jen, a Tsukai, or a Swami, a wizard, sorcerer, or warlock character works just fine in a game inspired by medieval Asian cultures. I kinda like Wusha. I like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I really like that movie. It's, it's great. And I wanted to read the book too, but I couldn't get a translation into any language that I speak. So. But uh, it's, this isn't only movies. They, they reference it as a movie genre, but it's actually a novel genre. There's a bunch of novels in Chinese within that, but it's hard to get them in translations. Okay, so Wuxia weapon names. I think players refer to a Tetsubo or a Katana rather than a Great Club or a Longsword can enhance the flavor of a Wuxia campaign. The Wuxia weapon names table lists alternative names for common weapons from the player's handbook and identifies their real-world cultural origins. Alternative name changes none of the weapon's properties as they are described in the player's handbook. Okay, Wuxia weapon names. Weapon Battle Axe, Fu, China, Masukari, Japan, Club, Yang, China, Tonfa, Japan, Dagger, Yisho, Tamo, China, Uzuka, Tanto, Japan, Dart, Shuriken, Japan, Lail, Nunchaku, Japan. Oh my god, this, like, I'm, I'm not sure if I should be reading that. It sounds boring and I might make embarrassing mistakes. Leave, Wandao, China, Vicento, Naginata. I, I didn't know what, what a Naginata is in Japan. And I do sound kind of English-Japanese when I read that. I don't speak Japanese, really. Anyway, Great Club, Tetsubo. Uh, Great Sword, Changdao, Nodachi. Albert, Ji, Kamayari. Handex, Ono. Javelin, Mao. Uchine. Uchine? I have never heard that one. Lance, Umayari. Longbow, Daikyu. Longsword, Jian, Katana. Maze, Chui, Kanabo, Pike, Mao, Nageyari, Quarterstaff, Kun, Bo, Dimita, Liue, Dao, Wakizashi, Thoughtbo, Hankyu, Thought Sword, Wang Dao, Pickle, Kama, Spear, Kiang, Yari, Trident, Cha, Nageyari, Warpick, Fang, Kuwa, Warpick looks a lot, well, I guess not as much heavier. I was about to say that a Warpick looks a lot like a Kama, but Kama is kind of light, right? It's, it's light, like a, like a sickle, but it does have the, the spike going straight. Like a Warpick, but Warpick, Warpick is very heavy. It's like a hammer with a, with a spike. Crossing the Streams The renowned paladin Merlin from the world of Oerth is featured in Greyhawk novels and game products. 
dresses in traditional garb of Earth's old west and wears a pair of six shooters strapped to his waist. The mace of Saint Cuthbert, a holy weapon belonging to Greyhawks, god of justice, found its way to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London in 1985. Somewhere in the barrier peaks of Earth, a wreckage of a space firing vessel is said to lie with bizarre alien life forms and strange items of technology on board. And the famous wizard Dalminster of the Forgotten Realms has been said to make occasional appearances in the kitchen of Canadian writer Ed Greenwood, where he is sometimes joined by wizards from the worlds of Oerth and Kryn, homeworld of the Dragonlance saga. Deep in D&D's roots are elements of science fiction and science fantasy, and your campaign might draw on these sources as well. It's okay to send your characters hurtling through a magic mirror to Lewis Carroll's Wonderland. Put them aboard the ship traveling between the stars or set your campaign in a far future world where laser blasters and magic missiles exist side by side. Possibilities are limitless. Chapter 9 Dungeon Master's Workshop provides tools for exploring these possibilities. Lol, that is an inside joke. I do know that Ed Greenwood was, I think, the creator of Elminster. And he would say that Elminster sometimes appears in his kitchen, but the other ones, I don't get the references. I'm not sure what's with the revolvers and the Mace of St. Cuthbert or the wreckage of the space firing vessel. A lot of the D&D authors know each other, my friend. Okay, so that probably would explain why the, why the other wizards appear alongside Elminster in his kitchen. The wreckage of the space firing vessel was a callback to an old module from 2.0. I'm actually curious about some of the old modules. I think they used to be a lot more laid back and kind of corny in a way. And I like adapting things that seem old and kind of out of touch to, to look different. If I can get my hands on any of that, I might read that just to draw inspiration from it. There is a literal Alice in the Wonderland campaign. Oh, can you get a Vorpal sword in it? Because Vorpal sword is a Vorpal sword comes from from Lewis Carroll poem, and you have to fight a Jabberwock. Awesome! Does it have the stat blocks for the Jub Jub bird and the Bander snatch? We never did get to find out whether or not this campaign has the stat blocks for the Jub Jub bird or the Bander snatch, because our viewer had no info, and this marks the end of chapter one, and with it the first part of our series, read by yours truly, though unworthy. If you enjoyed it, feel free to check out my Twitch and consider leaving a like under this video. Have a great day. Bye.